Hello, everyone. Welcome to my podcast, Dimensions of Reality. I'm your host, and my name is Marquise. Today, we're going to be talking with my good friends from UAP Studies podcast, Louis and Jason. Um, on this episode today, we're going to talk about the UAP report, the 2022 one, the new one, um, the state of disclosure, some very intriguing comments by some very rep reputable people, um, Enigma Labs, and a lot more. But first, I really want to introduce my guests, my friends. So welcome, gentlemen. Thanks hey, for having us to be here. Yeah, this is awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I'm glad you guys were able to do this on sh such short notice. It was kind of like a, a spur of the moment thing. You guys said, yeah, let's do it. And I was like, well, let's do it. And we're doing it. So let's do it. You so put why don't you guys sign up and we answered the call. <laughs> I and I really appreciate it because it's going to be a great it's going to be a great episode. We have a lot of, a lot of fun every time I've talked to you guys. I know people are going to love this conversation. So, Louis, Jason, if you could introduce yourselves please do so at this time. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, you want to go? Do you want to go, Jay? Me? You, you, <laughs> you me? go Rock, first. Paper, scissors. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Louis Borges. I'm, uh, I'm one of the co-hosts of UAP Studies Podcast. Uh, I joined in uh, January of 2022, so uh, just over a year now. And uh, I get to do you know, cool thing every Sunday with my best buddy and talk about my favorite subject. So for me, anytime somebody says, hey, you want to chat about aliens at 1130 at night? Yeah, <laughs> tell me which day. So yeah. here we are. I'm Jason Gilmet. Uh, I am the other co-host of UAP Studies podcast, of course. Uh, yeah, this interest for me has always been a lifelong thing. Um, I joined MUFON a couple of years ago. Not that I've done anything with the organization as of late. I'm probably one of the worst ones for replying to cases right now. Uh, but I've always had an interest in uh, UAPs and the phenomenon. Uh, absolutely, the abduction phenomenon is what I want to specialize in or what I would like to explore more. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, this is a, a passion of mine and uh, getting to work with Louie and have him come on and, and just totally change the podcast. And we just grew so much uh in the last year and uh yeah we're, we're having a ball we're having a blast yeah you guys have some really big guests I've, I've i've when i first found out about you uh we talked on facebook back and forth and then i went to your channels and i was like wow you talked to jacques valet you talked to every first of all you talked to everybody literally everyone in the ufo community you have talked to them all the big figures and the, the researchers and and you've got some new ones coming up which we're going to talk about that later in the episode but for the time being, actually, I wanted to ask you a question about that. So you're you're focusing, Jason, on the experience or phenomena. That's a, that's particularly of interest to me because of my experience. I am in, I guess you can call me an experiencer. Um, and so that to me is a really big topic, a really important one. Yeah. How and do it you goes, feel about that? It, it goes hand in hand with what's happening. I mean, if you look at the uh, documentation that uh, the UAP task force submitted and we just read and it was really disappointing, they – say that they investigate everything from air, space. It's funny that they put right. space next, right? They don't mm -hmm. want to put that first because that might give no. some in, you know, implications of what it might be. And then water. Uh, but nobody's investigating when these things land close to the ground and when people have interactions with the occupants of these crafts or claim to be taken by the occupants of these crafts. We've talked to people that uh, were part of the church they're experiencing these things the same as everybody else. People in the defense department, for crying out loud, are experiencing this. People in the military. So it's it's a global issue. It's not just taking place in the United States and Canada. It's everywhere. And it's amazing the, the amount of, of, of humans that are poss possibly being taken. I think that... Uh, who was it that we were talking to that said it's probably about something like 1% of the population or abductees or contactees of some sort. 1% of the population is people. It's crazy. Yeah. Right. I yeah. mean, it's a crazy amount of people. So yeah, that's been a subject that I've always been fascinated by, but Hopkins and John Mack had a huge influence on, on me for that, for sure. But yeah, I've always just been driven to those stories. Not that I've been an abductee myself. I'm just drawn to, uh, want to hear more about you know the contactees and their experience I, I would think you know the the fact that they haven't focused on i mean well gary nolan said that he was contacted by the government um to investigate the experience or phenomena at least from a military perspective finding out what what the medical effects are with contact with these craft 
I think that's very notable. It's very interesting. And again, we're talking about that throughout the episode here today. But I don't understand why they didn't focus on that in the report. The first report was great. The first report, I was like, wow, they mentioned non-human intelligences. They mentioned unexpected pregnancies. They mentioned health effects. They mentioned all kinds of things that they completely, it's almost like they reversed it. They kind of took, took it back a little bit. Like we told them a little bit too much. Let's bring it back a little bit. And they brought it back a little bit with this new report because they didn't mention, they has actually said there are no health effects associated with the with contact of the, with these craft. Now that's complete. That's in complete contrast to the first report. You literally contradict yourself within one year. Yeah. So what do you guys think about that? Louis, go first. Well, I would say you know anytime that it's again, it's just like we found a flying saucer. No, no, it's a weather balloon. So right. you know, having them give a little and take a little back. Again, if they had to make a statement like there are no health effects, you could have done. It would have taken like three pages in an official report to say, based on the last report, we made these you know, notes, we're going to do this, we're going to look at it this way. Here's how we looked at it. Here's the people we talked to. And here's the final conclusion. We didn't find right. any evidence of that. You can't make a one line statement mm. in any type of official government document. These things are phone books thick and there is no one line answer. So I thought it was odd that they just tossed that in there. I also thought it was odd that there was a delay there was a delay to get no information. I could see if it was so crammed full, right. you'd say, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it was four months late, but they were still tying up all these loose ends. Look how much stuff they have in there. All they basically said is, we're going to talk to these departments and this is the mode of collection of information. That's a standardized policy that they have in just about every department in the Pentagon, and uh, you know the Ministry of Defense and all that stuff around the world. Like, there's a certain way governments look into something. They have a committee. They talk about it. What's going to be our objective? How are we going to do it? Who's involved? And here's our forecast. It's all very regimented with everything that they study. So all they basically gave us is the method of collecting evidence <sighs> for a government-based study. Why was it four months late? And why does it have no information? Right? It's just very bizarre. And it's ridiculous. I, I, I said this when I was on Dave Scott's show. I said, you know, if this was loaded with information, it would be saying something. The fact yeah. that it's not loaded with information also says something. Right. So I agree. And I would say that the lack of information, especially when it comes down to, you know, the, the physical effects of these crafts. When you look at the study that the Department of Defense did, uh, what was it? Um, OSAP or the one that was Bigelow, right? Uh, when Bigelow was the in charge ATF. of... Yeah, OSAP was, came before ATIP. OSAP yes. and then ATIP. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when you look at that report, especially when you read the uh, Skinwalker Ranch, a book by uh, George Knapp. Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Yeah. Yeah. Skinwalkers at the yeah. Pentagon. Thank I you. I got the book right over here, actually. Wow. This guy. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, when you read it um, or, you know, get into it, it talks about the physical effects that some people right. have had with these, you know, orbs. Um, one guy had his three dogs incinerated wow. uh you know like it's just they're saying yeah. there's no physical effects well i beg to differ plus there's a bunch of orbs that cause some uh diseases in people and right. louis knows them uh what was it the japanese yeah, one? rare autoimmune disease hashimoto's disease and right. like just just things that are very obscure and very rare you know a small right. tiny percentage of people ever get it so to have even two people that have it in within the same contact, that would right. be crazy coincidental, right? And actually I wanna grab the book because there's something on the back of it. And when we interviewed uh, George Knapp and uh, Colin Kelleher, I asked him. So I'm just gonna Please grab do. this because yeah. I think it's important. Yeah, see, this is the, it, it is interesting how they, again, they, they retracted or contradicted, so to speak, their previous report. And now here, Louis is going to bring up the, you guys are bringing up the effects, which they didn't, they left out of this one. Let's exactly. hear that. Yeah, so this is the yeah. book here. We do recommend it, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Uh, it's with uh, James Lukatsky, Colin Kelleher, and George Knapp. On the back, though, and I hope I can get it clear, there's a little blurb, and it says, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon has been reviewed by the U.S. Department of Defense and cleared for public release. Wow. So everything in here, the, <laughs> you know, the blue orbs, the cryptids, the Bigfoots, the hitchhiker effect, everything to do with Skinwalker Ranch, the whole story of NIDS and Bigelow, the, the U.S. Department of Defense had to go through it and say it's okay. 
So they know the information for one, because they're screening people's books that have it. Right. Yeah, and right. number two, when we spoke to George Knapp and Colin Kelleher about it, they said that there was way more stuff they wanted to put in here that they simply couldn't. The government wow. scrubbed it and said, we're not going there. You don't talk about that. So wow. this is already a watered down version of the truth. And they have they have their stamp on the back. I mean, I could write a book about my opinion on Roswell. I don't have to get clearance from the government to right. do that. Why did this book need to be sanctioned from the government before it was published? Because yeah. those guys get information from people in the government and to keep that relationship clean. Same thing with uh, Travis Taylor. Everybody, whatever your right. opinion is of him, all he said was, yeah, I've been working with the military complex for years. In right. fact, one of his inventions is on the space station. So like he's a, he has five engineering degrees. He's a genius. Doesn't mean he's out for nefarious reasons, but these people that are privy to this information, when they do want to do their own projects, they're also subject to the scrutiny of the government because you're in this with us. That also right. means we open the book of your life and we're going to watch you. There's also been a lawsuit uh, against the U.S. military, and it was one. It was really? one that, uh, yes, there was a, a mother, a grandmother, and a son that were driving in this diamond-shaped craft that seemed to you know, have fire come out of the bottom, uh, flew over them with 18, and I say this, 18, uh, I think those Hercules helicopters or um, uh, the big ones. Anyways, I forget, I'm bad with the, the name of the helicopters. It wasn't Apaches. It was one of those those big Hercules sort of uh, looking. Yeah, I think know, those the are like the, the paratrooper coppers. 18 of them? 18 of them. Escorting and, him. Gosh. Yeah, the mother and the grandmother both got out of the car to take a look at this thing because it was directly above them. They both ended up with radiation poisoning. Wow. And so did the boy inside the car. The car was lit up when he approached it with the meter it just went off the charts and they ended up suing the u.s government uh because of the radiation po uh, the, the u.s government could not deny that this did not take place because mm -hmm. for them they didn't want this to go to court because they you know they don't want to admit that they were escorting yeah. a ufo right right so they won their case uh, 1977, you had those little orbs in brazil that were zapping people causing right. them to be anemic Polaris. Yeah, yeah, several people yeah. died, right? Yeah. Uh, so when they say there's no medical effects, it's because they're not investigating it close enough. You go talk to Jacques Vallée, he'll tell you there's definitely, you know, physical, psychological effects that take place. So, yeah, I find that funny. I think that we're still a ways away from them investigating that side. But they're if they're not included in the report, that means they're not investigating it. And I find out. it interesting yeah. when you see these uh, reports of helicopters or aircraft escorting ufos the only ones they're escorting are their own you can't yeah. escort a ufo if it wants yeah, to be on. gone it's, <laughs> it's gone, gone. You yeah. think gone. The plane in front and back <laughs> makes a difference i think it's their feeble attempt at providing a proof that there was helicopters in the air so that's what you saw here's the proof we had 10 of them you just saw it as a ufo so they could back it up but i think it's more to try to give some type of cover it's right. like a screen, you know what I mean? Otherwise, you literally have top secret UFO flying unaccompanied. So I think it's more of like a smoke screen because you cannot escort an actual UFO. If it is what we think it is, we no, can't even yeah. barely film no. the damn things. How the hell Unless it was it? flown by us humans, like we're taking it out for a test run or something like mm -hmm. that to yeah. right. fly it. Or and you're just being escorted because something went wrong and you need to go back to base and... You know, can't fly the ship, whatever reason that may be. But still, how the hell did they get their hands on that But what are they going to do if that is the case and you're flying it and the thing malfunctions? What are 15 choppers going to do? Like, right. That's a good grab point. you? Like, it would be <laughs> a massive a catastrophe. <laughs> There's literally no help that those things are going to provide. It's probably more yeah. dangerous than anything flying in formation with a, an unknown craft in the middle, you know? Yeah. You know, that that first of all, that's, that is a ton. That's great because... Bringing up the the Brazilist situations and others, that is a that, I think that's a big deal. We it's like people have left those out. They've left them kind of further on the fringe, but those are really well documented and cooperated incidences in another country that the U.S. has had a hand inside of. Just like what happened with the Virginia Brazil case that has been brought out um, in the documentary. Um, it's called Moment of Contact. Moment of Contact. Thank you. I couldn't By think our of friend second, James but, but, Fox. Yep. Yeah. So James Fox released that moment of contact just a, what about four months ago or so, 
And I have I've heard a couple things about it, but I feel like it's just gone completely under the radar since release. That is amazing because in the documentary they bring up, they show you the 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 um news, um uh the the news reporters that were were speaking to the general or the military officer who was who was directly involved with this. They speak to the eyewitnesses. They speak to other witnesses that were afraid to come forward. And there's so much cooperating evidence that this situation only happened but that the U.S. government was involved with retrieving the craft and the alleged body of the of the being. And during that incident, there was a health effect of one of the officers. He, mm -hmm. he died. He came in contact with the being. He picked it up, and he died the same yeah. night that he touched that, that being from yeah. rare disease. It was like a crazy disease. microbial infection or something right. like that, right? But here's the thing. All that information, that's like an old story. It's like 15 years old I know. because I know yeah. James Fox went back and forth for over a decade just getting pieces and pieces, had no uh, intent to make a movie. And then finally was like, hey, so we got to look at this. Like there's people in the, from the military, the there's medical doctors, x-ray technologists, like legitimate trained people that all say the same thing. And to your point, Marquis, about the US being involved, they all said the same. It, it went from the site to the hospital to be examined. Then the military took it to the air base and there was right. a US plane Ready to, they wheeled there it in go. there and away it went, right? Yeah. So, you, and the NASA was also involved. Allegedly, NASA was also right. involved with yeah. them. The US is NASA. I mean, come on, guys. Yeah. If, if we, when it comes to confirmation or disclosure, that's kind of why I wanted to bring these things up because I feel like there, there needs to be a conversation about what disclosure is. The US considers disclosure one thing, especially the US population. Um, I speak to a lot of them, but the Canadian government and people feel it completely different about disclosure than the US population does. The U.S. takes this position, this standpoint of a threat. The U.S. government takes the position of a threat, that this phenomenon poses an, a, a potential national security threat to the U.S. Canadian government feels the exact opposite, that there is no threat because there has not been any necessarily any intentional or any known intention to harm human beings in any way. Intentional is the word because there are side effects to just coming in contact or you want to call it any kind of um, uh, peripheral effects, but there's no direct knowledge of any kind of threat to us or any eminent danger like an invasion or something like that. So the U.S. is taking a completely different position. I want to find out why that is and kind of see what you guys think about that as well. But first, now that we've kind of set the stage for the fact that there is health effects and the 2022 report completely ignored that, um, they did it intelligently, but they but we're we're not we're not stupid. They're clever, but we we see through that. I wanted to talk about something else and some comments made by some pretty prominent figures like Gary Nolan. Now, there's an infamous document that's floating around the internet called Slide 9. And Slide 9 is allegedly a an A-tip. It's part of a classified briefing that A-tip gave um, when Louis Lozano was a part of the a part of A-tip. And this document says, and I'm going to read it because I think it's really important to understand. The science exists for an enemy, keyword, of the United States to manipulate both physical and cognitive environments in order to penetrate U.S. facilities, influence decision makers, and compromise national security. Psychotronic weapons, cognitive human interface, penetration of solid services, instantaneous sensor disassembly, disassembly which is really weird, um, alterations, manipulation of biological organisms, anomalies in the space-time construct, unique cognitive human interface experiences, and DOD advantages, DOD has uh, been involved in similar experiments in the past. DOD has relationships with renowned subject matter experts. The DOD controls se several facilities where activities have been detected. What was considered phenomena is now quantum physics. I think that that is a – that's just like a mind-blowing document. And when people think about why, ask the question of why isn't the government just telling us? The U.S. government seems to be the center of disclosure for the world. Why hasn't the U.S. government come forward and said, this is what it is, this is what is behind it, this is who's operating it, and so on and so forth? Well, if you read that slide nine, you get a pretty good idea of why the government doesn't just tell us. That would That's what would cause panic. It's not that there's life out there. It's that that life has complete you, you know, just autonomy to do whatever it wants to with complete impunity, and no one can stop it. And that's the fear. That's what the government is, the US government is talking about when it comes to potential danger or potential threat and fear. What do you guys think about that? I'll I'll take I'll just be quick on this one. You just said that, you know, they they don't want to admit these things. If you read what you just read again, right. when they say the science exists 
for an right. enemy of the United States right. to potentially use all this. That means you know of the science. You have it yourself. <laughs> As if you if you were get, like getting that information through espionage, you wouldn't be putting out in public information yep. that we know our enemies have these things against us. It's black and white. We have psychotronic weapons, uh, cognitive human right. interfaces, penetration right. of solid surface uh, potential, uh, anom what is it? Alteration of manipulation of bi biological organisms, cognitive right. human interfaces. <laughs> We can control things with our mind. That's just saying we have it, in my opinion. That's what it says. No, you're uh, so just so you, you're aware, it says DOD has, in, has been involved in similar experiments in the past. They go. are aware of it. What about you, Jason? Oh, no, they're aware of it. And the thing is, is what do they say? We use 12% of the potential of our brain. So there's right. a lot more room for growth. And you're right, you were talking about, you know, uh, telepathy and being able to move things with your mind is how many people I know it's, it's very much documented now. Um, the CIA did experiments with people that can see in other countries while they're sitting down having remote viewing. Of, yeah, yeah, remote viewing. Huge. And that's crazy. Like, when you start thinking about the possibilities, you know, that we have uh, these entities also seem to be able to focus on something inside of us that is not awakened, but they seem to be able to talk to it. And people say, you know, they don't say a thing. They, their mouths don't move, but you hear right. them in your mind. Right. Uh, they're able to do that for multiple people at once. At the Zimbabwe school, the aerial school, they talked to like 60 plus kids all at once. They all had different messages from this entity. Some of them felt like, you know, it, he wanted to take them with him and show them the ship. Other people were getting visions of the end of the world. Uh, right. Some other ones were getting different messages. That's crazy. That all came from yeah. one entity. And the potential there of, you know, are we capable of doing this? Well, yeah, they're saying that right there in that report or the slide nine that we are able to do these things. So, you know, the the power of the population must be huge or the potential there is huge, <laughs> right? If you think about it, if, oh, if yeah. you were able to do it, imagine if the masses could do it. The mm. thing I find cool about the Rua Zimbabwe case, because we interviewed Randy Nickerson, the guy who made the movie Aerial School Phenomena, right? You've interviewed everyone. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, thanks. We're, no, we still got a bunch of bangers. And this uh, next I'm missing months, Joe Rogan, then, yeah. Including oh, Gary Nolan, now. who we're talking about. So we're excited to take this information as well and bring that into our own show. But I was just going to say about the Rua Zimbabwe, the fact that it was multiple kids, they all got a different message. And they seem to have that same spectrum of good versus bad experience as average contactees. Some people said it was positive. Some people thought it was scary. Some people got a message. Some people just kind of stood there. They felt frozen. These kids had the same gamut. Some of them wanted yeah. to go with the aliens. Some of them were terrified. So it's like the human condition. Some will experience it one way. Some will experience it another. Maybe it isn't a positive or negative. It's just how we as humans are taking it. And I found that really interesting that kids with no filter and no prior knowledge of any of this, they still had that same almost like organic reaction that a lot of UFO contactee people say that they had. So I thought that was super but, interesting. So ironically, you know, even my experience, nothing bad. I don't even I mean, I don't know if anything bad happened to me, but my experience was just feeling fear. But nothing happened. I just was afraid. I didn't like what I was looking at. I didn't like the way that I felt. I didn't like that I wasn't in control. And so nothing, again, nothing that I was aware of bad happened to me, but for me, it was just fear of not being in control. And so, yes, I, I see, I mean, I can see how people are, they're, they're translating this experience, those experiences into a fearful one. And yet, it, it, like the kids in Zimbabwe, their fear was met with a warning, a, a warning about our own potential threat to ourselves. Um, yeah. We seem to be one of the greatest threats to ourselves more than anyone. I mean, we could just press a button and literally end civilization as we know it. And yet we're afraid of these beings who haven't ended us all, who have clearly been here for thousands of years, as stated by people like Gary Nolan and Jacques Vallée and others, given the history of people, human beings in contact with this this seemingly paranormal you know, um, a phenomena. It's been there forever. There are Bibles written about it. There is a Bible written about all kinds of contact with beings from other dimensions or another place or whatever. Um, and other ones like the, the Incas and the Mayans and the, and the Egyptians and you name it, all over the world, everywhere, there's accounts of these beings in some shape or form interacting with humanity and being yeah. like gods. 
So the fear I can I can understand. And even in the Bible, they say, you know, they, there are angels that met with humans. And those angels stay struck fear into the hearts of the men they were encountering. Well, these are these are angels that are from God, right? The yeah. God. So why are you afraid? Because there's just a we just respond that way to their presence. Whatever they are, that's how we feel about their presence. It's like it penetrates deeper into the being of who we are, the core of what we are on the inside. It's amazing. It's, it's just yeah. the idea of what they are is phenomenal. And we're going to talk about that specifically. Um, so the first thing I wanted to mention was a comment by Christopher Mellon. And in case audience you don't know who that is, he is the, to sum it up, he's the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence in the Clinton and George Bush, W. Bush administration, and later for the sec uh, Security and Information Operations. So he is, he's a pretty reputable person he, this guy's he's involved in the intelligence community he was he was a part of the national security and the apparatus in the defense department i mean he's a pretty important guy and he wrote an article recently after the dod released that ridiculous report who and i'm gonna i pulled a couple comments that i wanted to mention so i'm gonna read one of them right now unfortunately the report presents the bare minimum of information needed to comply with congress's request for an unclassified report in some regards the report is even less informative than the initial preliminary report released in June of 2021. For example, the preliminary report disclosed the number of incidents that were confirmed by multiple sensors, e.g. radar, visual, and IR. Moreover, New York Times columnist Julian Barnes, um, citing unnamed American officials, claims that some of the incidents involving U.S. military assets proved to be Chinese drones. That information may indeed be in the classified report, but is not in this unclassified report. There is also no indication in the report, if any, of the 314 events that were in space or underwater or were attributed to foreign governments. Unanswered questions abound. And that is – that to, to finalize that, that statement, unanswered questions are abound. Because the last – and like you said, Jay, uh, Louis, you said – Oh, they spent four months waiting to give us this report. Well, yeah, and they gave us nothing. It was, what did you wait four months for? We were told, oh, they're just, they want to make sure it's right. Well, they made sure it's right, but they, it's like skim milk, like 1% milk. You told us you were going to do it right and give us whole milk with the fats and the sugars and all. And you gave us 1% milk. Hey, four to... months late. The, <laughs> the original months. report, I think, was in Sour. March, <laughs> and this was supposed to come out by Halloween. So they already had months and months and months and months, right. and then it was four months late on top of that. So this was not just a, a four-month thing. It was almost a year from yeah. one to the next. Yeah, it reminds me of like a guy at a bar that's like, you know, trying to pick a fight and he t he's talking a big game, right? And you see him fight and he's like, uh, uh, he's just, you know, like a sissy. Like, that's exactly what that report was. It's just disappointing, oh right? Uh, yeah, that's but, great. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great analogy, by the way. I mean, there it, it sounds well, like all that would be in the classified report, but they're not acknowledging that it is because then right. that gives away the fact that there is some proof eventually. Right. The pressure is going to be to declassify that. So it's still a lot of don't talk about it going on. And this is evidence of that. And they did tell us that in the, in the 2021 report, they claimed they said they weren't supposed to be. And the NDAA, by the way, they're supposed to give us very clear reports about incidents that are not balloons, that are not drones, that are not airborne clutter. They're only supposed to focus on the ones that are anomalous. And instead, they focused heavily on emphasizing the fact that the most cases, by the way, over 50% of them are that of that category. The clutter, the drones, the, the, the so on and so forth, the balloons, the balloon-like entities, which I don't know what that that's is. supposed to mean. Um, it's what an interesting term to use. But then they, they did the exact opposite of what they said they were supposed to. They didn't follow, they didn't even adhere to the to the to the guidelines that they set for themselves. Frustration. And of course, um, unanswered questions. I'm not. I'm not expecting too much from them in the future. To be totally honest, to be totally honest. So the next comment that I wanted to pull from that that document, uh, that 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 piece that he wrote, was probably the most the most interesting and the most telling to me. Indeed, I've spoken with several credible people who claim the U.S. has evidence of alien technology in its possession. These are indeed exciting times. Now, if the DOD is not going to do it, if if a tip or I'm sorry, now it's arrow is not going to do it. If they're not going to do what they're supposed to do. Well, Christopher Mellon said, I'm just going to let you know that I know people who know people 
who are involved with these 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 possible alien material. And he's not the only one. Other people have come out and said that they are that there are people that have the U.S. specifically that have access to alien technology, and they're supposed to they're supposed to release that information. They put it in the NDAA. They put that they need to tell us about these things. So, what do you guys think about that? I think it's already been done. Uh, Bob Lazar told us in 1989 what the government was up to. He just laid it all out there. And I think for years, people still, oh, I'm not sure about Bob Lazar. What are you not sure on? Right? Because everything he said is technically the truth. It's it's happening right now. Right. Uh, if he says we have the technology to be able to fly like that report was saying, how the hell did you obtain that technology? Like, if you don't have anything to base yourself on, it's not like you just came up with the idea for zero right. point energy. Like, you would have to take that that from somewhere. Yes, I think we, you know, the United States have had possession of these crafts, uh, possession of entities. Uh, not only mm -hmm. do they cross the border on Canada to come pick up stuff, but right. they do it in Brazil. They do it everywhere. Brazil. Afghanistan, yeah. yeah, you name it. They'll if they could grab it, they'll ship it back home. They probably have the biggest collection of crafts of any country in the world, and that includes Russia, right? Russia's oh, yeah. got a few probably at this point, but uh, United States definitely beats them in the amount of probably species that they have too. So, and you know, I forgot where I was going with this, but uh, the, the concept of, of these crafts being here and us having the technology, Bob Lazar saying, mm -hmm. we're trying to reverse engineer it. We don't know what the hell we're doing. We're going to blow ourselves up. Uh, you know, this is really what's happening. And I've mentioned this several times before, even if you don't believe in Bob Lazar, Bob right. Lazar put, S4 and Area 51 on the map, along yeah. with George Knapp. And right. he brought a bunch of people in the middle of the desert at on Wednesday night, 730, to go witness UFOs flying. How did he know that at that yeah. exact spot, at that time of the week, they would see that? And he did it on multiple occasions. He brought people there. At the end, they were having parties and uh, right outside with beers and big <sighs> Winnebago's and everything. Like They didn't care if they got caught. They got really cocky about it. But they did it frequently enough that he can prove that he worked there because he, he knew exactly what was taking place there. He also How walked he into the that? facility. He also walked in S4. Everybody knew him. The guards knew him. He brought people with him like, hey, how you doing? Hey, everybody knew who he was. You yeah. can't do that if you don't work. You're talking about a very secure facility, like shot on site, very secure facility. Mm -hmm. How can a man like that walk into that facility if he is just a liar and a fake and so on and so forth? Come on. Come yeah. on. Like Even the janitor are, has a clearance in a place like that. Yeah, right? There is yeah. no there is no civilian, quote unquote. Everybody's no. vetted. And even if he was the janitor, I don't care. The janitor comes out and says, hey, guys, I'm working at this really creepy place. We're reverse engineering some shit. Uh, he's like you mentioned, he's got some clearance. And the fact he would have still put Area 51 in S4 on the map. Right. And he still would have brought people in the desert to go watch the, you know, it still proves that he's telling the truth. Including so I'm talking about element 115 yeah which in describing its properties before science officially announced that it was a thing it's a synthetic element that's created well, by to, you to your that. point on that marquis yeah. you were on um, the uh, spaced out radios weekend crew the other night and that came right. up and somebody was saying in the in the chat section that well you know when the periodic table of elements was created by that scientist it technically went up to 118 even years before now i'm not in i'm not in agreement of that as a way to say bob lazar is just you know i totally think that the fact that you predicted element 115 exists that it would make a good nuclear fuel i mean right. a lot of these other elements don't have properties of that ability you know like right. you look at look at all the elements in our world right i mean carbon is totally different from mercury you know they're right. just night and day the way you realign things and you have a totally different substance. So it's not like they're all pretty much the same where, no. you know, 114 was good uh, nuclear fuel. So therefore 115, I mean, essentially anything, anytime you could sort of split an atom, you have nuclear fission, but right. you know, the fact that he said that it existed, he showed some weird element that, you know, displayed those properties. Maybe that's <laughs> magic or just a bit of him faking it. I have a, a guarded opinion. But I do believe Bob Lazar, you know, the, and I think the biggest stones people throw at him is they say, well, you can't find his military record. 
Well, yeah, they wanted to scrub him because he was talking. So they erased his stuff. He's got the pay stubs and the mm. W-9 tax forms proving that the guy worked there and the government collected tax. So it's kind of hard you know, to refute that when you have your government ID, even though the public can't access it and you can't go say, hey, I want to see Bob Lazar's work record. They scrubbed him off the map. So that's usually the, the main things people try to slant him for, maybe embellishing his education a bit. Yeah, he right. probably did. He, he wanted to did. get a job at this place. So he probably right. beefed it up instead of taking a course at MIT. He got a degree from there. Like in the eighties, things were different people embellished and they still do today. So I'm not saying it was hundred percent truthful, but a lot of the things that he said 33 years ago have proven to be true. How do you do that? You're either incredibly psychic or you were there. <laughs> right. Which is, which I think, again, I think his credibility speaks for itself. If you do the research, anybody who does the research, on this, on Bob Lazar, if you come to a different conclusion than he was telling the truth about S four and these alien craft, you're you're just reaching, or you don't want to believe. You just completely... or read his book and get his own account, read it in his yeah. own words. Yeah, and it was it called Dreamland, Jay. Yeah, you got every Dreamland. book in the world there. Dreamland, right? Every book yeah, in the so... Dreamland. Yeah, every relevant book in the world, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah so yeah, read read his words and then make a decision. So the next thing I wanted to talk about, actually speaking of prominent people who have made some pretty bold statements, is Gary Nolan. Um, I have been fanboying over Gary Nolan since the begin since I first heard about him. I don't mean fanboying, um, but Gary Nolan is, in case if you don't know, he's an American immunologist, um, academic, inventor, and business executive. He holds the um, the Rackford and Carlotto A. Harris Professor Endowed Chair in the Department of Pathology at Stanford University School of Medicine. Talk again. We're talking very reputable individual, and he made a he he did an interview with Tucker Carlson a while back, and in that in an interview he mentioned he made a comment. Tucker Carlson asked him a question: Is there any evidence in the in the 100 cases? This is the cases that he had with investigating the DOD um the the health effects of these these phenomena with human beings um working with the DOD. Is there any evidence in the 100 cases DOD study of UFO injuries? that you have looked at where human beings were harmed on purpose. And Gary Nolan just straight out says, no, no. So the DOD is aware, and, and this is not just the only statement that I wanna pull, because the DOD also has been investigating the phenomena after, um, after Project Blue Book. They said they weren't, but they were secretly investigating it, and they haven't found it, and all that, from what, what has been said, there have been no direct conflict with UAP, at least um, in an intentional way, especially unprompted from what I understand. Do you guys hear anything different or how do you feel about that? Lou, we'll let you go first, my man. Yeah, I don't. Again, the key word being, you know, intentionally injured. Um, again, you like a lot of people have had experiences and encounters that cause physical pain. Calvin Parker is the first one that comes to mind, right? Like, right. He's, you know, his story, he had an alien shove their fingers up his throat and he started to bleed like up his nose and down his throat. I think he said, right. you know, some crazy... Jeez. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's terrifying to even think about. But if that happened, that's not, and again, maybe that's not intentional. Maybe that's just, you know, when a gorilla examines a, a mouse and happens to rip it in pieces, he didn't mean to do it either. It just, <laughs> just doesn't curious. know his own strength, right? right. So uh, I think that that's the key word in that. But I do also think that there is a somewhat of a benevolence. More yes than no, they're not here to hurt us, you know, on purpose. It's not that kind of, not that kind of an encounter. Yes. Some people have negative experiences, painful ones. Um, you know, some are very evil. They feel it. The entity is like trying to scare them intentionally. Right. But I think for the most part, we're just afraid. And, you know, we interviewed Reverend Carter, uh, Michael Carter last week, right, which I and watched. he's had all kinds of experiences. And he said, I'm scared of these things, but not because of what they did to me, just because I could turn they around and they could be one. there. Yeah. That's, that's how scary, I scary, right? I felt, so, yeah, when I heard him say that, I was like, wow, that's how I feel. It's just yeah. Yeah, not that they hurt me, but like they could literally show up. And he, sometimes at night and he, in his experience where he was afraid to fall asleep, I relate to that yeah. because there he are He still nights, is. He still is afraid. So am I. And I haven't had an experience, direct contact experience for like 10 years now. So like for me, it's like it's not that they can come, but there are times where I lay down in bed and I have this vision of their long fingers and their butt, they're just like walking into my room. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, like it could happen. It could happen. It could, and I'm talking to this all the time, mm -hmm. not like once in a while, like daily, every night that I'm asleep, I see up really late sometimes and I have that fear. So I completely relate to that completely. Yeah. 
it's trauma, right? That's you're showing this, yeah. the effects of lingering trauma. Yeah, it's still yeah. in. How do you process that kind of thing? Uh, that kind yeah, of I stuff? don't know. And we, you know, we often talk like the, the term alien is overused and comes with a bunch of baggage, but the experience is alien to us. It's it's not something that we've experienced before. It's not something that is normal. It doesn't fit our, you know, understanding of the world, understanding of ourselves. These things are very invasive in the sense that they just show up and you don't have a choice. You're going to come with right. them. You're going to comply. Right. They're going to tell you it's okay, but you know, it's you're still taken out of your element to this alien experience that you're not used to and that's what you know it encompasses a, a lot of things when you're saying the interaction between you and these entities it's not common you know it's it's not normal so it's going to make you feel uneasy because it's like you know you're afraid of that experience and some people have good positive experiences with these entities some people don't uh, it depends on how how you feel but I think it's very important that, uh, you know, people address that. Like, you know, some people have mentioned being tucked back into bed, you know, like these entities don't mean them any harm. They're right. going above and beyond, make sure the person's comfortable. They always return the person fairly unharmed, right? They might be prodded and, and poked with needles or something, but, uh, you know, people come back. I mean, there's horror stories where like people right. mentioning their <laughs> eyes being taken out, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Some pretty bad, <laughs> but, some pretty bad ones. And then the I put back in, it's just, oh, gross me out but um you know people it's a testament of their technology though it's a testament of what they're capable of right? yes like, but also that they seem not to have an understanding of pain right. so when they do procedures they're just like it's okay it's okay but it's painful as hell right yeah. don't worry uh, it won't hurt you and then ah <laughs> yeah all of a sudden surprise <laughs> oh my god it hurts yeah. a lot <laughs> <laughs> you said it that kind of like when oh, a nurse does... puts a, a shot in your arm uh, just a yeah, little like, pinch worry. fuck <laughs> that's that's yeah. a, pinch. <laughs> a little pinch all right you know it's it, there is a lot of ways to take it there's a there's an abduction uh case that i'm gonna kind of go into on one of these days um by uh, from someone called linda porter and linda porter she let me see if i can pull up and i'm just going to mention this briefly she was from uh, Covina, California, I believe. This is an abduction account from 1963. She was 17 years old when she first started having encounters. But she had them throughout her life for like 20 years or more, I believe. But she said – and this is – a I, I don't want to get too much into this. But she said over the years she was – she had multiple encounters, a lot of them um, into her 20s. And they slowed down kind of throughout her – later in life. But she said she was brought to a room one time where they had these cylinders – that were illuminated. And in those container, those cylinders were human vessels. That's what they, 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 the beings called them. These are like vessels for the soul. And their interest in humanity from, from her experience was that they were interested in breeding with us because we have a soul. And that soul, when we die, continues to live on afterwards. And they don't have that. Whatever they are, they don't have a soul. So they wanted that, and they, in order to get that, they needed to breed, to kind of mix their DNA with our DNA. So they've been tampering with our DNA, mixing it with theirs as well, in order to produce a a, a breed of hybrids that have a soul, but is still them as well. And there's an entire theory behind that. But and this is not you're not the only person who's mentioned this. That's an abduction phenomena. There's a there's a there's a writer, an author who was a professor as well, who studied the abduction phenomena. And he has the and he has a book called Alien Agenda. Um, I believe it's called Alien Agenda or Gray the the Gray's Agenda or something like that, where he sp speaks about the Grays and their agenda with 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 creating a hybrid race of beings that is essentially they're just like us. They look just like us there you can't tell the difference but the purpose he feels is ominous it's more ominous not necessarily a global takeover where they're going to kill us all but more so along the lines of what she's saying where they want something that we have which is why they don't hurt us they need us alive because they need our genetic material to mix with us to create a being that has a soul what do you guys think about something like that i think the soul and dna are separate i can see there being benefits for breeding Again, maybe they can't reproduce anymore. They've contaminated their genome. There's evidence of that on Earth already with right. the male Y chromosome. Even in like tigers, there's more female tigers than males. It's literally dying out. They think it's because of DDT pesticides that were used in the whenever 50s, 60s, right. 70s that it got into the food chain, right? From the smallest bugs eating grass and then all the way up to the mammals and everything else. So I think soul and DNA are different because 
otherwise when you passed away if they did a dna test there'd be a noticeable change in your dna right. so dna i think is separate from living cells doing their function i mean the dna is contained within that but dna is like the recipe everything else is kind of like the moving parts on the train and i think i think everything has a soul because if it was just a, a civilization that died and that was it and nothing carried forward no knowledge or whatever I can't see them getting advanced enough within their lifespans if there wasn't some other kind of help or ability to, I mean, let's be honest, mankind's greatest inventions came from inspiration. People right. were in spirit. Uh, they were meditating. They were Gary petitioning Nolan. this consciousness. So how would you get that advanced if you just lived X number of years and died? And that was that. Right. I mean, and again, because my belief is that we do have the ability to access this. It has made us better you know, some great minds like Tesla and there's been a lot of and just magical people that have done things that like in their lifetime that some people haven't done in hundreds of years. So uh, my personal opinion, I believe soul is separate from DNA. Soul is from God. DNA is from like nature. It's just a, what animal you happen to be. It's your vessel. But I think the soul, you can't create it because it didn't come from creation. It came from the creator. So let me add, let me let me add a little bit to this to this um this scenario here. What if we are just the, the the DNA that creates us, our physical body, our physical being? What if we are just the vessel for the soul? Then wouldn't it make sense to if you were an intelligent race that doesn't have a soul? For I'm just again, it's just hypothetical. This is a really far out there hypothetical. What if you just needed a vessel that was able to contain a soul? Because during Linda Porter's abductions, that's essentially what she said was being done. They were, they were swapping souls into these vessels, and it wasn't that they were creating a vessel that had a soul. They were creating a vessel that could contain a soul. Yeah, you upload or transfer. That's kind of like the search for the uh, what do they call that? Like the the magic fountain, endless right. the fountain of youth. Right. So that if your body was decaying and dying, you could then transport that into some other living being. That makes more sense to me. But I don't think the soul. First of all, I believe all living things are sentient. They have that energy from, you know, the consciousness of the creator. So I don't okay. think there is anything that is lifeless. And even to this day, we cannot make life. Even when no. we do hybrid stuff no. or, you know, in vitro, we're still taking living cells right. and other living cells and breeding them together. Right. We can't take You're a piece of paper material. and a shoe and make yeah. a dog. We're not that that you be we're playing the role of God. I that's my opinion. I'm a spiritual. Why'd you name guy. him Nike? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Jason? How, what do you think? What do you think here about this? Well, there's two. I have two theories. Uh, one of them is that they're trying to do an integration with us. Uh, that okay. it's important because if we're going to join them in whatever it is, the progress, the next thing they keep telling us, raise your consciousness, raise your consciousness. We hear that over and over again and study it quite a bit. And the issue is like, why is that so important? It's because it's important only to fly these crafts because these crafts operate on consciousness. Consciousness. Yep. Yeah. And they move like they're conscious. They almost have a feel like the pilots say, like it's almost like it looks at them, even though there's no, windows there's nothing but they feel the consciousness of this craft just checking them out they're also uh, precognitive that, because they like yeah. with right with with um um ryan graves and with, well i'm sorry with uh david fravor commander david favor he said they were at his cap point you know and yeah. the cap yeah, point the was only known, yeah. right it was only known by them they didn't they, that's some that's classified information that was only told by them yeah. so that how did it know that how did it know that part of the trickster element that speed that that people have mentioned before yeah, like even people on the ground will witness a UFO and say, like, it's as if it knew that we were watching it, like it came closer to us, right? Or came right above us, or or whatever. And that is crazy because if it's th at that point, it's almost like a, a sensitive nerve that picks up on any right. thought or anybody looking at it. Uh, that's that's amazing. Uh, even Kathleen Martin, when we spoke to her, she said that uh, her aunt Betty Hill um, uh, had asked uh, about. Uh, you know, can you find us? Like, how do you find us? She goes, and the little entity said, we can find anybody anytime. Oh, like, they, they know. Where, yeah, they know where you are. Like, you know, some people say, you know, right. I live in New York. Uh, and then all of a sudden you go to California, you get an experience in California, the same as you do in New York. How is that possible? How do they know that you're there? They just do, right? 
Yeah. That's crazy. That that to me blows my mind. Like that, it just means a consciousness or you know, this free will that we all think that we have, maybe it's not so much free will because at any point in time they could come and just interrupt that. You know, that's the part that's most right. disturbing for people is that the fact that it's been interrupted, that somehow there's a violation that took place because I wasn't in charge anymore, right? right. I couldn't control the situation. It just happened to me. And so a lot of people uh, look at it as almost the same effect as rape, right? A violation right. Of, of the person, violation of your rights. They infringed on it and did whatever the hell they wanted to you. And right. there's nothing you can do about it, right? Uh and then the other ones, like, obviously, if we're going to join them, uh, we would need to physically match at some point, right? Uh, people saying, oh, they're, they're hybrids. So what if they created us to begin with? Right. right? So we, we keep saying, oh, they're making hybrids. Well, what if the hybrid is just a, another part of the another, plan? Right. Exactly. Like right. We were the first part. Now they're overseeing it. And, you know, the same way that they're, you know, you're tagging animals and, and, and keeping knowledge of what they're eating, where their foot patterns are, and, you know, what uh, their hobbies are. Uh, basically, they're doing that to us. And there's a select few, maybe yourself included, sir, uh, that are going through that. You know, there's something about your genetics or something about your spirit or something about you. Maybe, mm. uh, you know, your, your awareness of, of things uh, that they're attracted to. And that's, that's what they do. Well, Gary Nolan, and I want to, there's a couple things I want to mention. There's a, there's a girl who, I read this abduction account of a girl who, I don't want to give the long drawn out version, but she essentially was taken into woods by a, a female. Um, she was on a, she was with her family at first, but then was taken into the woods and she was taken into a cave. And this woman was really nice to her. Very nice. And there was a bunch of people around. They were all nice to her. They prepared a meal for her. They tried to get her to, she was upset. She wasn't very comfortable with it. They tried to give her a meal that she liked. They asked her what she wanted, but she just wasn't feeling it. And eventually they brought in a little boy and they tried to get her to mate, essentially mate with this boy. They tried to get her to like him, to get him to be nice to her, get him to like you know, they just she just wasn't having it. She was resisting and she was resisting them until eventually she just wanted to go home. And the one girl, the one lady that was there was upset. She was angry and she grabbed her and she said this. And the girl said she put some pressure on her chest really, really hard. And another female that was there said, don't hurt her. Let her go. Do not hurt her. We can let her go. But no matter where she goes, we'll always find her <laughs> like that was this girl's experience when she was a little girl. Now that's a who knows what intelligence that was. You can't ascribe that to any particular intelligence, but if it is related in some way to the abduction phenomena, it does say something about the fact that we don't have control over what happens to us. Ultimately, we don't have full autonomy in this world in this life. And I think that that's essentially what the, that's part of the fear that the government has in telling us what's going on. It's not only that they don't fully understand it's that from what they do understand, it doesn't feel good to them either. And so we don't, we're, we're, we're all trying to fumble around and figure out, we're, I mean, it's a confusing mess because there's, there's, there's everything from fairies and big, Bigfoot to nuts and bolts UAP craft to angels and demons and poltergeists and you name it, abductions and experiencers and contactees. There's all this stuff that is essentially a part of the same phenomena expressing itself in what seems like different ways to different people. So, um, but I appreciate you guys' input on that. I really wanted to find out what you guys thought. I'm going to, I want to move on to the next comment by Gary Nolan on the document in the documentary. I know you guys have probably seen the need to know documentary by Ross Coldheart and Bryce Abel. Yep. Awesome documentary. I was floored. I almost cried with excitement. No, I didn't. But I, but if I could, I would have. And in that documentary, Ross Coldheart and Gary Nolan have a back and forth. And he's asked at one point, um, is, uh, what is the danger? So when asked if it is a dangerous thing to admit that you think these things, Gary Nolan talking about the phenomenon and his belief systems on it, Gary Nolan responded, I think it's dangerously necessary. I think that this is the kind of thing that if we continue to ignore it, if we continue to ignore the potential danger of what it might represent, we are putting ourselves at risk, both at what it might do to us at some time in the future but then ignoring the physics of what these things are capable of. That I think was a, was a comment that I found particularly interesting because he's not saying that there is a danger. He's already said that these things have not, of the case he's investigated himself, there's no direct danger. There's no danger. There's no eminent danger, but there is a potential danger. And so for scientists to um, debunk essentially the data, that is the data cannot be debunked. It's data. It's there. It's telling a story. 
for scientists, I'm not going to mention whose name, who say things like that the the kids in Zimbabwe saw a teddy bear or a, a, these teddy bears or whatever, or these people in costumes and they were driving a bus and that's what those kids saw and they made up the rest in their head. I I feel like that it, there's a danger in that because let's let's forget who whether they're a danger or not. If you're a scientist, your curiosity should be spiking at this the data about this phenomenon yeah. and the fact that it's being talked about by reputable people like Christopher Bell and Gary Nolan and others and of course now being officially investigated by the DOD. Come on, yeah. I mean, how what do you guys think about that specifically? I think scientists are super interested. Uh, like you said, scientists should be. They are. Guys like Avi Loeb and Gary Nolan and right. Jacques Vallée, and it goes on and on and on. I mean, I, we've had so many on our show. I just can't think of them all right now, but they're already interested in this. And some of them are getting funding from the government. So it's not, you know, and, and to your point on what you were saying about that exchange with Gary Nolan, when he was saying those things that, you know, th words like it's dangerously necessary and, you know, it's not inherently a threat, but not knowing is a threat. I just think of Stanton Friedman. It's very much his uh, flavor of, you know, like we need to find out. We are going to find out. You can tell me to go away, but I'm still going to keep doing what I do. And that's like a movement. And God bless him for the life that he led and not being scared to to not just take fluff for an answer and to say, right. no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can't just say that because that doesn't jive with this. And good on him for doing that. And I think a lot of people in the science world are doing that now. We have Gary Nolan coming on in two weeks. We're super excited to chat with him. Oh, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's tough to get these big brains condensed down to an hour show. And even themselves, like they have so much going on in their brilliant minds. It's hard to just like make a format for a show because they could talk for hours right. at nauseum about any right. one of these particular points. So we got our work cut out for us. There's such a thing as uh, being arrogantly ignorant. And nice. I think that people forget that they're able and capable of doing this, you know, nice. like to the point of saying, it's so far-fetched to me to think that an alien craft landed and that uh, two little entities came out. One of them spoke to a bunch of kids that I would rather conceive the idea that it was a bus that stopped and teddy bears came out and waved at the mm -hmm. kids and all the kids. <laughs> right. like, you know what I mean? Like, you got to be kidding me like to the point where you can't even wrap your head around maybe it's a possibility and that maybe the theory about the bus and the teddy bears is ridiculous <laughs> like that school is in the middle of nowhere africa right. like who would say hey what are you doing this morning <laughs> nothing you want to dress up like teddy bears and go scare some kids <laughs> at the school like nobody would do that and, and then think about the it a school bus and teddy bears <laughs> yeah a school bus and teddy bears are, are familiar to those kids they would clearly define it they didn't know anything about aliens or ships and never been right. told any of that so when that happened they were like it looked like some kind of a bubble and creatures like they didn't even call them aliens they just described what sound an awful lot like aliens yeah. in a spacecraft right. but a, a bus and teddy bears are familiar to them they wouldn't have mistakenly said you know that's a car not a train or that's a bear not a rubber ducky like i have right. an 18 month old she knows the difference between her <laughs> bunny and her teddy bear right so there's it's... no way you know kids w would not recognize that i think what you say is a testament to like this idea that human beings are not very good observa uh, observers. I think we're pretty good at observing, you know, the just basic reality. We may not be good at observing things we are not familiar with, but even when we're looking at something we're not familiar with, we're not. It's not so unfamiliar that we completely lose, like the the the, the substance of that thing. So, for example, Reynolds from Forest. You're talking about a guy who they claim saw a lighthouse. Well, he didn't touch a lighthouse from miles away and then hallucinate the black structure of a craft that had writings and symbols. Like, come on, we're talking about it, it, the, the, the man was responsible for he was in the military. He was responsible for defense. He he's not so far removed from reality that he can't describe his observational reality. So, yeah, it's it's kind of disrespectful to, to have those takes, those debunker takes versus being analytical and skeptical. And yeah. if you're skeptical and analytical, you're going to come to a very interesting conclusion no matter what data on this phenomena you're, you're looking at whether it's you you do you, you kind of you kind of get rid of the balloon phenomena and the entities the balloon like entities or the drones once you get rid of that stuff you got a lot you got 171 cases of something strange and then you have brian graves and you know 
you know, uh, Commander David Fravor. And now there's a new podcast with Ryan Grace where he's talking to pilots who've seen more things. Yeah, You can't dismiss that as people just not being able to to, to understand observable reality. And what I found funny is when uh, uh, I think it was Mick West that said it could have been seagulls that, yeah. you know, Captain Fravor saw. Oh my gosh, that guy. I can't Yeah, it. it's <laughs> just like, what? Seagulls? You need to tell me that we spent millions of dollars training these experts and they're just flying and they're going, oh my God, what is that? Let's go chase it. It's a bunch they of seagulls. They should be fired immediately. Like, yeah. come on, man. Not to mention the machinery that they're operating right. is Multiple meant to have bombs methods. on it. Yeah. You're going to trust these people to know when to drop it and when not to hit the school. Yeah, but right. he's going to see seagulls instead. That's an yeah. insult to his training. He's the and most to their skill. Yeah, there's nobody above that for trained observers. I think he's a Top Gun, isn't he? Is he everything yeah. but a Top Gun, or is he a Top Top Gun? Oh, I can't remember. I, I think he's a Top he's Gun. Like, like he's yeah. He's... Well, ask him. He's coming on our show in a couple weeks. Awesome. Let's. Yeah. Uh, I, I, Ryan Graves. Man, this is what I mean. You no, guys Ryan like, Graves. Yeah, it's uh, Captain Fravor. Yeah, we, we I'm didn't sorry, Commander, Captain Commander David Fravor. My apologies. Commander okay. David Fravor is like everything. I think he, he's either a Top Gun or he's everything but a Top Gun. Okay. And Ryan Graves, again, of equal caliber. I mean, these guys are the best of the best. Yeah. yeah. And not only do they know, but they've talked to people who – and another thing of the whole idea of you can't – you're talking about someone who talked to someone. Well, these someones have all experienced something. They've all seen something, and they've seen it with multiple people and multiple observation methods that we trust for national defense. So again, it, 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 just as you guys are saying, it doesn't. It's kind of it's a it's a bit idiotic, or it's intentionally deceptive to say things like it's probably seagulls that they're misperceiving these objects as seagulls. And then well, they must fly super fast and meet them at the cap yeah. point. You know what I mean? Well, and you said you're going to talk maneuver Ryan... them. Like, yeah. yeah, come on. We're talking, again, yeah. undeniable data. You said yeah. you're going to talk to Ryan Graves. On his podcast, he mentioned he, he talked to someone about, you know, about what he saw and described the, the, the circle with the cube inside of it. We're, they're describing things that are just – they're phenomenal just by appearance. Mm -hmm. They're not describing – what looks like a seagull with wings and feathers and a beak and whatever, and making, ah, oh, oh. they're saying that these are weird things that are performing in exceptional ways. And they got a good look at them. There weren't fuzzy yeah. grainy no. uh, kind of this or that. I couldn't tell. No, it was like a Tic Tac or it was like a box and very, you know, specific in what they saw. They got a clear look. It wasn't just, you know, from afar. Yeah. And when I, the one that really irks me is was like, how do you know it's not ours? How do you know it's not our technology? Like, I'm going to be 42 this year. I have 42 years of being a human expert. <laughs> I've lived amongst humans. I know exactly how we think. I know what technology we're capable of, what is like out there that's I couldn't even fathom anybody coming up with. So when right. you have these trains observers, you know, that are, like I said, there's nobody above them. Like there's nobody they on this planet. They are as good at this as, as those guys are. So when they come down and they go, what the f was that? Yeah. Oh, um, they're, they're on camera, like, what is that? What is that? Whoa, freaking exactly. out. Exactly. You hear them like the actual reaction, like, what is it? Like, they're freaking out. That gives me goosebumps every single time. And when they said, uh, you know, there's a whole fleet of them. Yeah. A whole oh, fleet yeah. of them. Like, look at the ASA. There's a whole fleet of them. Like, yeah. Whoa. And that's another it, thing that we don't get it, in the report either, right? The, the fleets. It, that when they here's an interesting clusters. point on that. Here's an interesting point on that. So apparently, the US does have some crazy stealth machinery. I don't know if they're aircraft or what, but they do simulation bombing runs in and around the Nevada area. So the aim of the game is this stealth craft is impeding airspace, and we use the best fighter jets we have with all of our technology to try to go find it and intercept it. So they're trying to test if this thing is detectable or not using the greatest planes on the planet, which are the ones they also own. Right. So they're using right. their best planes to try to catch their best stealth fighters. And they have not yet successfully intercepted this once during <laughs> any of the simulations. Yeah, so these things are showing up because they want to show up because if right. we wanted to test our top secret junk, we could do it without <laughs> it being seen. There wouldn't be a mistake where you got F-18 pilots saying, wow, what is that? Like, as Jason and, said, all the, yeah. the audio that we've heard, they have stuff that we cannot even catch ourselves. It is that good. And so they're that's how you know it's ways, not ours. And they're and again, it's not China's or Russia's because if it was, you, you got to come on. Like, like, I sometimes want to plead with people. Please tell me. Why China or Russia would have sat on that technology when they're they're literally willing to wipe everybody else off? And 
Espionage yeah. keeps everybody sharp. If Russia had it, this happened during the Cold War. We stole info back and forth from them like right. crazy. Oh, and yeah. it made both forces really good to the point where we're like, OK, now it's mutually assured destruction if we each do, you know, with the stuff that we made because of this fight. So if Russia or China had it, somebody else would have it. Russia would get it from China. The Americans would steal it from Russia or like there would be a way that we, we would know about it and we would be emulating that same thing. It would keep yes. everybody's game sharp. Right. None of us are even close to competing with whatever these things are. Or another, China or Russia would have used it. So Yeah. Another thing in the report, which I thought was very interesting, it said there's been no collision between a UFO, UAP, and an aircraft. Yeah. So that you got to think of all the reports that they get. There would be near misses. There would be incidences where, you know, for crying out loud, we got planes that crash into each other all the time. Right. right? That just happens. A small Cessna planes or whatever. Um but these things don't happen. And people say like, you know, these crafts will approach the aircraft and just stop within feet of it. Right. Like it just knows exactly where to stop and it could take off again, come back. And, you know, or as they're flying, like, as they're yeah. flying, it can like mirror them right in front of their, uh, the, the cockpit. Yeah. So yeah. Like and they do that to cars as well. Cockpit. That's yeah. so weird. They That's do that weird. to cars as well. Yeah. I had a nurse in uh, Vancouver reach out to me and she mentioned that, uh, there was an orb one night, green orb that fell right in front of her uh, car window as she's driving over the bridge in Vancouver. And it just followed pace with her backwards. It did a wow. scan of the car and then flew back up and that was it. But she got her terrified. And like, it just came down and followed her like perfectly, just the same amount of distance and never, flu you know, never fluctuated. Uh, that's insane. And, yeah. you know, people are experiencing this on, you know, not just orbs, coming out of the sky they're seeing you know multiple crafts uh sometimes multiple crafts that turn into a big craft or a big craft that turns into multiple crafts right uh it, it's just such a weird phenomenon uh, even if we would try like to us it's magic right it's just right. a science is so far advanced to us it's magic we don't understand it and i think that's the scary part and why they don't want to disclose things to the the general population because we're outsmarted these things have more intelligence more science more technology right. they just Listen, we're 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 very primitive compared to these things, right? By far, by yeah. far, we are. We're like monkeys. Not even. We're we're less than that. We're yeah. We like, like to think of ourselves as equal with other, you know, galactic oh. neighbors. Because in every movie we have, we're always defeating them, and yeah, you know, somehow they're, they're equal equal to us. Somehow their aircrafts are always have a vulnerability, a soft spot. Man, I think we're the closest, so full of shit. Yeah, I think the closest thing I can think of to like like the superiority of these of these beings in movies would be like the day the earth stood still mm. where the keanu reeves version where like this orb drops into the to the middle of like i think it was new york city and then it releases this weird nanotechnology driven automaton and they're like hey by the we're just collecting all these orbs go to like different places to collect all the species on the planet like the, like a note like arcs you know because we're destroying the planet and they're and they're like the only solution is to wipe out technology um yeah. to save us essentially and given you know and again i'm just just a comparison of like superiority of of this tech they're so far advanced from us and and again they also bio you know made a freaking human in days from a blob, right? Do you remember? Do you guys remember that movie? They they kind of oh, had yeah. a blob, and they they people took it, and it turned into a human, and it was Keanu Reeves, and it's like, it isn't even. It's not even the being. It's just they're using it as a vessel. That was yeah. just the most. It was interesting. It was interesting. So, so I want to bring up another comment, another another back and forth. I thought was really, really. I think it's probably the most, the most interesting because one of the things I think is 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 a problem is, when we talk about this phenomena, we focus heavily on the craft UAP. Unidentified anomalous now phenomena, UFOs, and then unidentified flying objects as we all know them. But we don't talk about what's who's behind them. And there's a back and forth that I wanted to really get in get into between um Ross Coldhart and Gary Nolan. So let me just kind of pull it pull this out. So he's so he asks him. I'm Ross gonna run Coldhart, a quick bathroom break. You guys keep going. I'll be right back. Sure, no problem. So actually, while while he while he's uh, while Louis Louis runs to the bathroom. I want to bring something else up. I want to bring something else up. So there was a there, – there, slide nine is, is just one of many slides. There have been accounts that have talked about this other I, – I guess you want to call it conspiracy theory. That has, been, that has been mentioned by some pretty prominent figures like Stan Friedman, of course, 
um, and uh, and um, Bryce Sable about Eisenhower and others having direct contact with these beings, with the race of these beings. And Eisenhower specifically, I believe, was the one who I think it was Eisenhower who had a meeting, allegedly had a meeting with them out in the middle of the desert or something like that. When he was supposed to be doing something else, he was off the media's radar and he was actually meeting with extraterrestrials. And he made a he made a deal with them that he would allow them to abduct a certain number of American citizens that they had to document and that he would in exchange, they would give us technology to help us further our civilization. And they agreed to it. The problem is that they didn't stick to that agreement. They were abducting more than they said they would, and they were not tracking who they were abducting. They were doing it rampantly. Um, and th that worried the government and the DOD. It scared them because here they are dealing with a completely advanced, like a, an advanced race of beings that is way out of our control. And they could do whatever they want to. And now they're doing whatever they want to. And there's nothing we could do about it. And that's essentially kind of where the, the beginning of our fear of, of well, the DOD, the U.S. is fear of these beings began that's allegedly do you know anything about that 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 alleged meeting between them or did you not kind of dig too far into the into i the... i personally always dismissed it because there's some aspects to it if you think about it that doesn't make sense he would have had to set the parameters of what the united states is he would have had to explain to them or somebody would have to explain to them what a country is what the right. borders are and to adhere to this this specific group within this line here that's all you can take We're, we know it's a global phenomenon in that everybody's being taken everywhere right right um the other one too it's like even if you had an agreement usually in human terms we have some sort of contract where we get a right. signature how do you get an alien to sign something they wouldn't understand the concept of it like, put your squiggly line here and then we're going to hold you to it have you like, seen Bryce you Sable's it? um tv series uh dark skies i have not no so they do a they they do an a recount of that uh, of course a, a dramatized and into entertainment version of the account, and it's really odd. It's like these really weird looking gray like beings, and they release this like morphing object, out, you know, onto the table that flattens onto the table, and he says, "I think you're supposed to touch it, Mr. President." And they're like, "Don't!" And the, and the military guy's like, "Don't touch it, Mr. President." And he does anyway, and it changes again. And essentially, that is that was like the 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 agreement, and there was an it was a non negotiable agreement in the in the show, right? But this, where does this information come from, right? Well, like Bryce come Sable out? suggests that he was given information directly from the, about MJ twelve about the the their involvement with hunting down this phenomena, investigating the phenomena, and directly with a, these ETs. Um, mm -hmm. He says he talked to people about it, and that's where he got the inspiration. Essentially, he got some of the inf inspiration from like talking to people about the phenomenon. Now, at that party, which I've mentioned before on other other podcasts, he, he was at a party that he hosted for the launch of this pod of this uh, TV show, and he met these two figures that said they were from the Air Force. I can't remember the specific department, and they they gave him the secrets of the universe, and it was like on a napkin. It was like light, sound, and frequency. I think it was, and not in that necessarily that order. But they said when he sh when he showed them when he talked about the the series, they said they don't like the one aspect of how the phenomena is because it's not correct. And he said, I don't care if it's correct. Bryce Abel said, I don't care if it's correct. I just want to make an entertaining series. So on the one hand, he completely dramatized and exaggerated, make it and made them kind of violent and scary and like horror type thing, which I didn't like that either. I did not like that because I was like, well, if you're going to do it, then it was a great series, by the way. But I didn't like the aspect of the the beings, the ETs being literally like like weird, scary, monstrous creatures that like physically infect your body and they d d d dig into you and they're weird looking creatures like alien. Like it was it was bad, and that was the aspect they didn't like. They said that's not how it works. That's what they told him, and he didn't care. He kicked them out of his party. Long story short, that's essentially what I from what I understand about how he got the inspiration for that TV series. Was from some inside knowledge, not not not. I, I guess he clearly dramatized it, but that he got the idea of the ETs in the in the contract from from insider information. Right. Let's so see. I don't, I don't know. Know. Who could? You, it's not verifiable. I don't think it's verifiable because he doesn't. Isn't he doesn't that from like the time of Eisenhower? There was supposedly an agreement yep, that's that's they could abduct what, so many people and yep. this and that. But interesting yep. thing, somebody did a study. And I'm trying to, it might've been Daryl Sims because he's very much an investigator. He's been looking at UFOs and data for years and years. But I think he basically said that 
when you take the number of missing persons in America in a year and you remove all the variables, the ones that are found, the ones that aren't or everything else, there's and I think the number tossed around was like 48,000 or 60,000 people. Supposedly Eisenhower agreed could be played with in a year in exchange for tech. Right. right. So, but he goes, yeah. when you filter down these missing person reports, you're left with pretty much 48,000 people that, they just go nowhere. They're like right. every case has some evidence and some trail, but these people just flat out vanish. And so there's their, uh, I guess, summary of that is that there's something to that, that there was an agreement made um, who knows, but it's interesting to hear anyway. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I appreciate you gave you guys give me that feedback because both of you have different perspectives. I don't know what to believe. I, I, I think that if it is true, man, the government's got some answers. They got some. They got to answer some questions. They got to answer some questions. Um, if it's not true, man, there are some pretty, you know, reputable people that are saying that it is, and they have some questions to answer. Like what they're saying that they're obviously saying somebody said that this happened. I know someone that said that this happened, and they trust these people. But again, if it's true, well, that's without the American people's consent. You know, yeah. making a deal with a race of beings without the American people's consent. Come on. That is a that's that's just the lowest of the low. But yeah, I'm I would sorry say that. Yeah, I was going to say, Marquise, that, uh, you know, there might be some sliver of truth to what, you know, that story. Right. There might maybe Eisenhower did show up in the desert. Maybe he saw a craft that we had in our possession. Right. Maybe there was a body that he observed. You know, they're just here you go, Mr. President, this is what we found. Uh, that maybe there wasn't a truce or anything like that that just became the legend after the fact but i think yeah there's probably some truth to to that because it's lingered around for however long now right, right. so yeah i don't want to dismiss it entirely that's not what i'm saying but skeptical skeptical is yes it's skeptical of it because there's just not enough evidence there to suggest right. that that actually did take place right we can't prove it it's just a, it, it is one of those things that you can't prove but there's yeah. a lot of like you know witness testimony that has that hasn't come out officially like well um i don't know if the disclosure project uh, they put out these witness testimony, a, a playlist on Stephen Greer's YouTube channel. He has a playlist of all these these witnesses. We're talking very, very famous and important people in the, in the U.S. and in the DOD and the government and the intelligence community. And one of them does mention that encounter between he he says he claims it is a legitimate, hundred percent true um, fact. And he he gave a witness testimony on it on camera that's mm. been published. So if you uh, maybe I'll if I can find that by tomorrow, I will put that in the show notes. If anybody wants to check it out, you can check it out. It's really interesting. I think the whole playlist of the witnesses are really interesting. So. All right. So let's move on to the next question that I have. Um, so Gary, uh, Gary Nolan is asked by Ross Coldheart, what is the phenomena? And he says, you know, I wish I knew. And of all the people I've spoken to um, with on the inside. There is very little unanimity about what it is, except that whatever it is seems to be so far advanced from us that it beggars understanding. And Ross Coldhart says, so you don't think it's human, the phenomena, what I'm to the phenomena. And Gary Nolan says, oh, I'm sure it's not human, which is a pretty bold statement. And Ross says, is it intelligent? And Gary Nolan says, yes, it certainly acts like it. And in some cases, it seems to have a sense of humor. So Ross says, so Gary, the implications of what you're saying, there are enormous, or they're enormous, aren't they? You're suggesting that there is a highly advanced civilization that is intelligent, it's not human, and it's real. And Gary says, yeah, I'm almost, I almost hesitate to call it a civilization. A civilization implies a, a, lo um, a lot of interacting parts that are moving towards some sort of goal. I couldn't even uh, say that, that that's what it is being observed or it's something like that. Now that's a that's there's a lot packed into that. The first thing is he's saying it's obviously a non-human intelligence. Bottom line, that it is intelligent, it's not human, and that it has this, it in some cases it has a sense of humor. And he can't even ascribe it, the idea of it having being a part of a civilization. Like to me, I'm floored. He th that to me is like it's enough th to give me a clearer picture of what's going on here. It's not a drone. It's not balloons. It's not balloon-like entities. It's not this. It's not that. It is a non-human intelligence. 
part of what would we would we think it's a civilization, but it's not even that because it's not acting like a unified a unified civilization. That that kind of leaves the the implications of what it is open to so many things. What do you guys think about that? To me, it sounds like it doesn't seem civilized or organized because it's from many different sources. Maybe each of those sources that is visiting us has their own sense of organization and civilization. But and that kind of fits in with a lot, what a lot of people are saying about different species or different looking creatures or whatever they are. So they don't seem to be organized because the events are so varied and so random and the stories are like night and day different because I think we're interacting with multiple different sources of this. I don't think it's one entity, one species, one interdimensional, whatever it is. I think it's everything and everything all at once, essentially, you know, so mm. that's my thoughts on it. I would agree with Louie. I think that, you know, the most laughable question in the future that we'll laugh at the most is, are we alone in the universe? <laughs> I think once we find out exactly that, you know, not just what's on other planets, but the interdimensional, is there time travel possibilities, right? Where entities, you know, us from the futures, when we change completely biologically, can come back and, and check things out and see our origins and maybe try to take something with us in the future. That's all possible at this point. Like we're not dismissing it. The thing is with studying this this phenomenon you could almost create a college or university course like a four-year course where you would get your master's because you have so many different aspects of the phenomenon to study and and right. try to understand it because it fits somehow in the whole puzzle that is this this phenomenon and we often say on the podcast it's like getting little pieces of the puzzle Right. And you start stacking them up. You don't have the complete pictures yet, but you're starting to see something form. And over time, you're getting more and more pieces of the puzzle and you start seeing an image there. And that's exactly what's taking place. That's what disclosure is, is just give us more pieces to the puzzle. Right. We don't need to know the whole thing. We can piece it together ourselves, but at least start getting enough of a, of, of a puzzle going, if I stopped using the word puzzle, um, <laughs> to uh, basically establish an image. And uh, so we could all understand that maybe there's something above our heads that is way past our pay grade. We won't understand it, but at least be aware of it and mm. acknowledge it. And maybe right. that might lead us to something better. It's data. It, it, there, um, I believe it's Jock, Gary Nolan said Jock Vallee told him to stick to the data. Because it, talk about the data, focus on the data. Because a lot of times when, it, you know, he said, he said, you know, he's made these comments and people like me, I, I'm guilty. We, we stick to these comments that he makes, you know, like, oh, you know, I, I'm, I, he says, I'm certain it's, it's not human, right? I stick to that when he says, you know, we can look at these, uh, these beings somewhere on the spectrum between on, in that same documentary, angels, demons, and God. Well, holy crap, like you just you just told us that not that they're angels, demons and God, but that we're looking at them like they're on that spectrum, that they are godlike, that they have been godlike to us. And they've always been that way. And so the implications of that are just profound. And so I stick to them and I kind of, you know, and he was he was told you got to be careful because when you do that, essentially, people will do people like myself will be like, yep, it's aliens. We know for a fact Gary Nolan said it's aliens. I'm not saying that. I don't think that's fair to say. But I just think that the, that the statements, when, they, when he's looking at data that we can't see, some that we can see, but some that we can't see, he's saying that based off the data, and this is a scientist, a reputable, a very famous, a very, very uh, well, you know, established scientist is saying, when I look at this data, it tells me that there is something that's not just a balloon or a drone. It's not human, but it's intelligent <coughs> and it's interacting with humanity. So that's kind of how I see these, th these comments, these things. So when these guys make a comment, they either they know or, or quickly find out that people will hold them to it. And right. it's broken telephone. In fact, even Ross Coulthard, as much as he hates the world of UFO Twitter, that is his <laughs> domain. Right. And uh, he put an interesting comment out the other day, something to do with ancient civilization and he was like, you know, look how precisely these stones were machined. Even our greatest industrial lathes couldn't do it like that to today, uh, today's standards. And somebody said, you know, Ross, it's real convenient to just slip aliens in there whenever you feel like it. And he's like, I'd never even said aliens, <laughs> like read my post. But because you know that he's in the field and likes right. to write about it, talk about it, 
people just automatically connect the dots. He did not even say that, but no. that person read Ross Goldhart saying aliens made this structure. And it's not at all even in his writing. So when no. you become known for something, your work gets twisted. Same with Gary Nolan. There's a rumor going right. around the internet that him and Kit Green are working on some kind of a DNA activated yeah, vaccine. Yeah, I just heard about that. He well, flat this, out can... denies that you can no. quote Gary let Nolan. Me, yeah, nope. let me pull up the tweet, the tweet yeah. so that we can officially say that because he denied that on yeah, Twitter. He goes, Nope, I never no. said that, nor did Kit. So flat out, that is not true. But this stuff gets out there and then it starts being passed around. It's like like high school. You hear a rumor. Did you hear that uh, David Becky broke up? Yeah, I heard that. Did you hear why? <laughs> Next thing you know, it's this gigantic yeah. story and Hollywood is full of that nonsense. That's what tabloid media is. And uh, it's kind of, it's easy to happen, I think, because of who these people are, because they put out a lot of content. But I, I think uh, we need to be careful now more than ever where the information comes from and what we take as facts. Even on these type of shows, a lot of podcasts out there, a lot of videos, they have some very outstanding <laughs> claims. Yeah. Don't get too wrapped up in everything that's said. Everyone has good intentions. They want to make entertaining programs. It's not always factual. Now, there's a lot of very good shows out there. Marquise is one of them. We have some other affiliate Thank programs you. we like, yeah. but be careful. Some people drop data like it's fact. Like, well, you heard that there's, you know, such and such and such and such. And people go, oh, yeah, I didn't know that. Next thing you know, you're telling people as if yeah. this is like provable stuff and there's nothing to validate it. So be very careful now more than ever is my advice. Yeah, he said neither I nor Kit said that at all. Um, and it was like that they were developing a they were working with a, a group of scientists who were trying to essentially create a, a way to find a way to it, um, enhance the human psychic abilities, because hmm. because what's been what's been speculated is that based off the data, there is based off of actually observation of human, the DNA of, of experiencers and abductees, there's something different about abductees or experiencers. Um, that they have essentially increased uh, um, increased intuition in life, and they make decisions based off intuition. But they're highly effective; they're very, very highly effective. But that that was completely rejected by 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 Gary Nolan. He said it's not true. I can't find the tweet, and I, I can't go through scroll through Twitter for the next hour trying to find it because there's so much stuff going on so fast. I can't pull it up. But yeah, it, it, it's it's I think that's ridiculous. It's it's un, it's unfortunate that that happens because they, Ross Coldheart and Gary Nolan spend a lot of time defending their comments and defending their their hypotheses and their and their you know their their ideas about this this field. And I think it's ridiculous that some of the people that have put stuff out there claim to be people who want disclosure themselves. Some of the people that put stuff out there have less to offer to this entire movement, this disclosure movement or whatever, than what people like Gary Nolan, who to us is very recent have. And they've been, and the people that are that are making these, these uh, clearly debunking uh, comments, they've been around for decades, some of them. So, um, and again, I, I will not mention any names, but if you guys want to throw some people in there, I mean, you, you can say whatever you want to. Because <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're going to get into the kind of the funner part where we're not, and it's not as structured at this point forward. We're going to talk more about just kind of what you guys are doing and what's what you think about what's going on and things that people have said. It's going to be a little bit looser, a little bit more of a conversational stop from this point forward. I wanted to get those comments and those, um, those quotes out so we can kind of set the pace for how, you know, I believe, and my belief is changing. There is no, I don't have a definitive belief about the phenomenon. I used to think it was angels and demons, right? That it was a, there was one phenomena that they were angels and demons, that it was biblical. Cause I'm a Christian. I'm a, I'm a Bible believing Christian. However, I don't believe like a lot of people believe, especially in the U S I mean, these, I don't know what people, I believe in love. I believe in compassion. I believe in altruism. I believe in sacrifice. Don't handle believe, snakes. No, I do not. No? I'm not. Okay. A, I don't drink poison. I don't, you know, I, I mean, come on, man. Like, you know, I, I don't You're believe missing it. out on all those orgies, uh, man. That's, They're out that's there. Okay. <laughs> 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 well, well, I, I, I'm not, I want to live, uh, whether it be a snake or, or my, my lady, I don't want to die either way. So I'll stay away from the orgies. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but now th there's just the more and more that I learn, I, I can't say, I think maybe there's angels. I think angels and demons plays into it, but I don't think that's all there is. I no longer think that that's the end all be all of this phenomena. Something else is going on, something bigger, something more. And to, to think that, you know, I believe in a God, I believe in a God to think that I believe in a God and that I believe that there are angels and demons, but I think there's something bigger going on. 
come on. The, to me, it's like, it scares me. But again, that fear is because I don't know. It's not about anything that I know. It's about what I don't know. We fear the unknown yeah. and not being in control. So, yeah. That not being in control is a big part. Big part. Big part to play of it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I hear people say all the time, the abductee phenomenon, I think, like you said, Jason, is I think it's more important than the DOD's giving it credit. And I think mm -hmm. they know that, but they're not publicly admitting that. Because in the, in the experiencer phenomena, there's a story to be told. There's also this idea that, like, that they walk among us. That's something that's been talked about a lot lately. And there's been some claims that because the NDAA, there's going to be whistleblowers that come out this year because there's that whistleblower protection. It's not complete. It's not perfect. But it does say something, at least, within the parameters of these structures, the intelligence community, the DOD, the, the military. They're allowing, they're, they're protecting people who are, um, official, who are whistleblowing in a, de in a classified setting um, in a legal and appropriate way. So no Edward Snowden. We are stealing files and publishing them to public. But like you're inside, you see something and you want to say something. They protect those people from any kind of repercussions. What do you guys think about that 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 per se, that kind of aspect of the, uh, the NDAA? I, I think it's great that legally you could go to a court of law and not right. lose your job per se. They would still make it very difficult. If, if you went against the grain, something would still happen. You know, uh, that's just my personal opinion. There is no car accident, maybe. <laughs> well, and even though there is legal protection, where's the reputation protection? Airline yeah, pilots right. now, where's their protection that my colleagues are going to think I'm nuts because I'm talking about UFO encounters? So they may legally, you know, be able to sue their boss if they get wrongfully let go. But big companies, like everybody seems to have this kind of, sort of belief in the protection of like, well, they can't fire you. You you know, you've been there 20 yeah. years. They could fire your ass right now, write you a <laughs> check nothing. and say, here you go. We don't like you. You're gone. No, but there is no, you need grounds or probable cause. That's if you're trying to convict somebody of murder in the world of mm. business and how governments work, you're with us or get lost. And if that involves writing a big fat check, they do it. And, you know, they make you sign that stuff when you take these roles that your non-disclosure is right from day one. So, and it's another point of that where they're allowed to disclose things in a legal way that does not include uh, things that are, are um, uh, completely like um, sequestered like or SAP, hidden. The SAP programs, the special yeah, classified programs stuff. There is no legality yeah. behind revealing classified right. information. That's like treason. So I think it's a bunch of nonsense. There is no protection for these people. They know they're taking a risk and the taboo is still there on your reputation. Even if legally they can't fire you, Right. You're not going to have that same level that you would have had if you kept your mouth shut. And I think getting blasted on social media is keeping a lot of people quiet. And even guys I mean, like Ross Coltard think the same thing. Well, Ryan Graves is experiencing a lot of that now, of course, yep. with those big debunkers. He's got this podcast. He's talking about it. even and again, even uh, Commander David Fravor. There, the fact that we have American citizens specifically who put a lot of focus on the idea of patriotism, who are disrespecting these these service members who are they're risking their social reputation and so forth by talking about these things. They're being disrespectful. They're not even, they're not looking at the data. Honestly, they're, they're trying to find faults and they're trying to find any alternative explanation that isn't even part. That's not even you. You're they're jumping through hoops to get to their conclusions like balloons and, and teddy bears and so on and so forth. It is, it's a sad, it's sad. I don't, I don't, I don't put a lot of faith in what the DOD is doing, but I, but I want to give them a chance to, to try because I don't want to make it seem like we we've, you know, they don't have a chance. You make them feel like they don't have a chance and they'll treat us like they don't have a chance. Like we don't have a chance at disclosure because we're accepting the idea that they're not going to anyway, but we shouldn't accept that. Well, I expect them to show us something or we're going to make a noise. That's what I want people to do. I want people to feel like, no, 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 not, not, they're not going to give us something. They better, they better give us something because we vote. We have a voice. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on social media. We influence the world. We influence each other. And if we all collectively say, no, we, we refuse to accept this watered down disclosure that you're doing, we want the truth. I think that's when we push them and push and push until eventually they have no choice. If they do try to give us that retraction in the, in the, you know, the, the balloon explanations for five years. They've been doing it for 70 years very successfully. 
on something's different this time though. Something is very Hope so. they're setting up Hope apparatus so. apparatus to to really dig into this phenomenon. And not just from a uh, from a DOD and government perspective, but from a civilian perspective. Private industry, they're they're, you know, UAPX and you know, and now with this Enigma Labs that I want to kind of talk about, the Enigma Labs I think is a very in, ambitious effort, it seems, at least on paper. Um, they promise to, or they they say that their goal is to provide a way, a means for people to submit their their incidences and to use that as part of a data collection, um, and to treat this phenomena like data science, to collect as much data, weather data, um, sensor data, you know, witness testimony, as well as what NASA's, I guess NASA's data and satellites and so on and so meteor phenomena. They're trying to collect all this different data so that when they're looking at these accounts, they can verify and, as they say, give a rating, I guess, about whether or not that that incident, each incident, is is vi is a true incident. Um, I think that it is ambitious. I think that it, it that it's that the ideal is great, but I hear a lot of uh, different opinions about it. You know, a lot of people are not they're very hesitant because they're collecting data from MUFON. They're sharing data with MUFON, which I guess MUFON wasn't supposed to. They were supposed to protect people's information, but if they're giving that information to you to uh, to Enigma Labs without their, I mean, you're talking hundreds of thousands of people. Um, their data is now being shared, allegedly going to be shared with Enigma Labs. The effort, I think, is good. The privacy factor and and the and the intention behind is questionable. So that being, yeah, go ahead, sorry. James. I was going to say that being said, we already have compromised. You know, uh, you look at your phone, for instance. You think right. that it's not spying on you? It's spying on you. Um, I had an Alexa here, and it did not last long because this one time I was sitting at the computer and I was cleaning the desk. And I said to my wife, we need a uh, paper towel. Next thing I know, my phone's advertising to me on Facebook. Hey, paper right. towels on sale. Uh -huh. It's like, what the hell? Like yeah. Alexa totally told my phone that what I was looking at. You or can Facebook, turn what that it's like. off, but you have to dig into the settings to turn that off. But that you should have to yeah. dig and dig and dig. Yeah. But like I said, they already have all the information anyway. So right. we're, we're all compromised. If you got TikTok on your phone, oh, it's China done. knows everything yeah. about you, right? Yeah. It's, it's already done. So it's... I find it funny when we're like, oh, no, they're going to take my information about UFOs. Well, it's no, we should be sure. It's too late. And we should be talking about it. Anyways, this is something that everybody needs to talk about, like the close encounters. What I find funny is that they're trying to do the satellites and the testing, all that stuff. Um, but so, a lot of the times these UFOs, if they're legit, messes with the equipment will make right. something not work or it doesn't even get picked up on radar or or they have to know. completely change their method of observation and the the type of data that they're collecting because they're the, these things are operating sometimes at frequencies different mm -hmm. frequencies or in infrared but not in optic like vis visually optic um vis visible to the eye or visible you know and it's again it's you have to the data is more complex tracking these things down is a lot more complex than just sensor data it's yeah. a lot more complex yeah absolutely agree these are my thoughts on uh, enigma labs here and again this is just based on what i've heard what some of our connections are telling us but essentially hey guys, one second i lost your audio here i can't hear either one of you not sure why. Can you hear us now? Um, what just happened? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. you. Can hear me, but I can't hear you. That's odd. Hold on one second. Let me see. I'm connected. I'm connected. Everything's great. Why is it doing this? <laughs> <laughs> there had to be something. Oh my god! Can you Hold unplug on. your headphones? Let me see if I change the audio output. Hold on one second. Uh, talk, please. Can you hear us now? I can hear you now. There wow. You the audio just stopped uh, with the headphones. Hold on. Let me see if I can. Okay. Can you guys say something again? We're still here. Okay, great. So audio fix. Sorry about that, guys. I'm gonna. We're just gonna keep going. See the guy. This is that. To Jason's point, they know what's going on. They're messing oh, with your yeah, electronics. These guys, listening these to us. Sons of gun. Here's my my again, <clears throat> just my brief opinion on Enigma Labs. You read the language on the website. It's like somebody went crazy with a thesaurus, mm -hmm. or used an AI program to write it. It's not written in business English. It's not written in the same flavor as government speak. It's supposedly an agency that's 
petitioning people to bring us your request. And it's not even written in a language that the average person would want to do that. There's not like, we're here to help. There's none of that. You go to their About Us page, all it says is we keep our membership private to ensure our, our privacy. Number three, they don't say what they're using the information for, who they're sharing it with. They won't confirm or deny after working with the government. Um, and I believe they I believe they just recently confirmed that they work with the Department of Defense and Arrow. OK, another uh, rumor mill recent. is that I don't MUFON know is true, in though. MUFON is in bed with them. Nobody from MUFON that we've spoken to has confirmed that as far as we know, mm -hmm. everybody's MUFON case that was ever given privately is still kept in confidence. Now, Enigma, on the other hand, is not giving you that that guarantee. To me, it looks like they've invented a glorified software program that you mm -hmm. can just pump reportings into, and it's going to assign varying degrees of believability to it. So, well, this was a CE4, and this was a CE1. So the CE4 will go higher than the one. It's like they're going to discredit some of the lower cases because the person didn't see an alien or touch a craft. But it doesn't it doesn't you know negate the fact that that was a very important story in itself. Right. So I don't like the fact that they have a glorified spreadsheet. What are they doing with the data? And they're basically saying, just give us your reports, but not telling you what they're going to do with it or who they are, or who they're going to share it with. <laughs> so and the, the language is cryptic on the site. It's not very well done. Um, there's people that we've interviewed on our show before we believe are connected with it or and maybe even be the ones writing the material on the site. Right. It just seems like an ambitious, the site looks very professional. Graphics are great. It just doesn't, something doesn't quite seem right about it. It looks like to me and rumor mill is it's another Bigelow, some billionaire with a bunch of money who wants to do this, who already has other special access programs that are being funded. This is the way you get money from the government. You set up one of these things. Here's our mission. Here's how we're going to do it. The people that are working in a contract basis with the government know how they run. <laughs> so they know how to keep this baby going, whether it's military contracts or intelligence or anything else, software. So to me, it looks like a business. It looks like somebody trying to collect data that they can use as a bargaining chip or as a way to get funding. You know, you go on LinkedIn and search Enigma Labs. It's like eight people. None of them seem to be related to each other any which way, shape, or form. Uh, you know, Peter Thiel, I believe, is a guy's name, the billionaire yeah. that's rumored to be behind this. I think it's a bunch of hype. I wouldn't trust it. I don't often give my opinion very strongly. I would stay the hell away from Enigma Labs. You don't want to tell us who you are, what you're doing with our information, how it's being scored, the fact that I might pour my heart out to you about what I saw and how it affected me and your computer kicks it out because it's not high enough <laughs> on your scale and you're not telling me that. My opinion, stay stay the hell away. MUFON, people have varying opinions on MUFON. Yes, there are you know, politics within any big organization, but the boots on the ground investigators, those guys doing it for free, and driving and spending their own gas and doing all this to, to take these reports seriously, it would be sad if that just got thrown away uh, and, and not given the credit it deserves. So regardless of your opinion of MUFON, at least they haven't. And let's be honest, the government knows every single file that's in MUFON. Already, right. OK, there's, yeah. there's no yeah. smoking gun. There's no, no like, oh, shit, how did we let that get out? Why did not we find that 40 years ago? They <laughs> already know. OK, so but I just don't like the fact that. These people want to come in with sort of this cryptic light and uh, and try to gain or garner for your your trust or your uh, your report. You don't know who they are. You don't know what's being used with that. We're more conspiracy based than ever before. So keep your eyes open. Don't be sending. And you can submit a report with very little information. Dave right. Scott and I did one while I was on Space Out Radio the <laughs> other day. We sent in a report. It's not given the same type of care and attention and investigative techniques your information goes into a database that assigns it in rank and file based on how probable it is and which ones we should look at or not no magic secret and the fact that they want to hide behind that you want to get people's trust tell them who you are we're scientists there's eight of us this is why we're doing it this is what we're doing with it then it will work otherwise it's just like somebody's pet project that they're trying to get sap money from the government for mm -hmm. just my two cents yeah, I that would even a... say with with MUFON, uh, you know, like you'll have somebody who will give you a call 
and follow up. Even if it's something that took place four years ago, you're going to get a phone call from somebody. And if something is recent, like, you know, something landed in your backyard, that person will drive to the location and do an investigation there with their equipment. So they actually care. This is somebody who's doing it for free, like Louie was mentioning. Don't get paid at all for this. Uh, we're doing it because, you know, it's it's boots on the ground and you actually care. And with MUFON, you know, the nice thing about it is that you have to pass an exam. So it's not like everybody can be, you know, just join and become an investigator. There's an actual exam, a book you got to study and get a certain passing grade before you're able to join the organization and start investigating. So, you know, when somebody reaches out to you that they actually care, that they put in the work that needs to be put in there for them to be able to help you. Uh, with this program, by the sounds of it, uh, it there's no follow up, nobody cares. And the computer gives you a, a ranking on, you know, whether it's good or not, like everybody's going to embellish their story right. now because they want to have a higher yeah. grade, right? Where's the BS like, filter in the software? Yeah. Where's the human questioning that says, yeah. are you See, sure you saw that? Or you think you saw that? Yeah. There's no filter. This is just a database. This is not this is not what they're pretending it is to be. And MUFON, you know, the name of the person. You go on the MUFON website in Western Canada, Jason's name is on there as like the chief guy for Western Canada, right? So they are open about who they are. They have business cards. They give you their phone number. They're not hiding behind a veil saying, we're not telling you who we are or what we're doing with your data. That is ridiculous. Tell us what you saw on the night of June 7th. <laughs> <laughs> the men Get them now, guys. Get them. You know, yeah. see, when I, when I've, I, I was, I gotta be honest with you, I, I get excited quickly, easily excited about a lot of things that I, that I find important. So, and I'm new. So when I, when I, when I find out about these new programs or this, whatever, I tend to ask, you know, ask Louis, especially and say, Hey, man, what do you think, man? Because I don't know. And I don't have enough experience to really be able to determine what these things are and, or what, you know, these efforts, especially with these people are. And I didn't have the perspective you guys are just, you just provided. I just thought, Oh, it's very ambitious. It sounds great. It's nice. And then whenever, you know, I talked to you, Louis, we talked about it. I looked again and then I started seeing the things that you were talking about. And I was like, Ugh, I don't know. It, Just I'm read not the too... language. It, the sentence structure is weird. They start sentences with words like because. Yeah. Any yeah, English wasn't... major knows you don't start a sentence with well, the word because, you know, like stuff it... like that. I I kind of I was I was forgiving when I first saw that. When I first saw it, I was like, man, this, they're, they're terrible. Their grandma and I'm my grammar is not perfect, but like their grammar was you're, you're you're running an official site that you're saying you're working with a DoD exactly, with, and this is your exactly. this is how you're going to deliver your message. I I did have some hesitation there, but I kind of I again I wanted to give some leniency. Um, they have a big backlog of 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 past incidents of historical incidents that are really it's really good, but yes, I, after I listened to what you said when we had a conversation privately, I looked at it again. I did some more research. I did some more digging, and there's a lot to that organization or that effort that I just don't agree with. I'm not, I, I think they have a lot to prove. If they're going to do what they say they're going to do, they have a lot to prove. And, and they're saying they already have a bunch of data. Well, there's already data publicly available. We talked to Cheryl Costa. Right. She's got a, a, a friggin' huge volume for every single state in the U S of all the number of sightings, where they were per capita. It's like a census on UFO Again, sightings. And the, so you the start government. pumping that stuff into software then you have, you know, uh, government archives that talk about, you know, uh, um, UFO encounters and weird things like you did. You were talking about that the other day, Marquise. There's stuff that's not classified. You right. can go and find if you know where yeah. to dig. Yeah. So they're just filling a database with the stuff that's already available and they need, but they need the real cases from the population. That's the new stuff. And again, I would be very careful now more than ever with your info. Just just be careful. Again, government programs, they're not, they don't have a crappy website with poor grammar. Neither no. does military. No. Neither does intelligence. There's no typos. Just Although they do careful. tend to put up, they do tend to put up some very suggestive logos sometimes by accident. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm talking about? The uh, the picture of the UFO along with the jet and all that stuff like that for the new aero office. Yeah, that was, oh, it was an accident. Somebody yeah. did it by, you know, was messing up. You never around. know. It could have been the IT guy just saying, you know what? Today's my last day. I'm putting this on our Twitter page. They like, should have told. It <laughs> could have been. It could have been. They're not going to kill him for no. something like that. No. But I, oh, I could see God. somebody getting a kick out of that, you know? That's, that'd be something Bob Lazar would do. <laughs> yeah, that's true. He would definitely do that. It would cost him coin, too, because you got him, you know, was it all embroidered and everything inside the <laughs> yeah, badge? Like, yeah, 200,000 uniforms. It's too late Yeah, now. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Even which, a, like, 
What were you going to say? Jeez. Sorry, no, Jason. I was going to say with the, just as the insignia, it reminded me of uh, Space Force. You know, they're actually yeah. putting together like, and I always say, like, do they come up with the crew first and then come out with the ships or the ships already built and then they need to fill it with the crew? Like, how does oh, that man. work, right? Like, just, oh, we're, you know, we're, uh, what was it? Um, for all threats, basically in space, right? Foreign, domestic, and unknown. And basically that's their job. And again, you know, you're mentioning how screw up we are as a species. Every weapon we have in space, all the nukes, everything that we don't know about, they're all pointed back at us. It's like pointing guns at your own head, right? And instead of like pointing it out in space towards what could possibly come at us, we pointed at ourselves because we are <laughs> the biggest threat to ourselves. We are. Yeah. And then here we, we are, are. Like, why are they interested in us? Well, we're fascinating. Like, we're self destructive. That's crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah, we're quite the species, man. Yeah, I saw a meme of like where there was like these aliens that were it's it's season 2023 of earth and they were eating popcorn like you know they yeah. eat popcorn. <laughs> the greatest yeah. reality show in the universe oh yeah. yeah we are we are something else and you know when we look at well, this is a philosophical idea when it comes to how we see ourselves versus how other beings might see us when we look at ourselves we think of ourselves as the apex we are the apex predator of the of, of the universe so to speak like you said earlier jason about movies like you see movies and we win well, how the heck are you going to win? I, I can't imagine. Every time I see those movies, I'm like, we, we're just like, we're just lying our way through this this plot because there's no freaking way we would win against these aliens or yeah. a zombie flick, which I love. Like, there's no way we would survive survive a zombie apocalypse. It's just not going to happen. We're all going to die. If there's a zombie apocalypse, we're done, guys. There's no surviving it um, of any kind, especially if they're the fast zombies. So, like, you know, we we think of ourselves as the apex predator. But now we realize that there's a bigger fish out there. I mean, at least we're starting to realize and admit that there's a bigger fish out there. And it makes me wonder how we should how we should feel about ourselves as a civilization. What do you think the best way we should see ourselves as as a civilization would be when when thinking about there being a bigger fish? Hmm. That's a big phil I know it's a big philosophical you know question because I've been asking myself let me let me let me tell you what I what I've been. I've been thinking about this because, you know, there's war. I said once that we kill each other over dirt. And that's, I mean, literally, literally over dirt. But we have a necessity as, a, as an individual human being across the world. No, no matter where you are in the world, you need to, you need to survive. You need to eat. You need to drink water. You have to, there's some, there's certain things that you need as an, a biological organism to survive. And then on top of survival, there's the feeling of the feeling of happiness or fulfillment. We all seek pleasure and avoid pain. Our brain is designed to seek pleasure and avoid pain. And yet somehow we contradict our natural biological imperative as a civilization, which to me is bizarre. And it kind of, again, I, I think about the fact that we're, we're, we're going against the grain, so to speak, of what our actual nature seems to be, which is to thrive, to seek to thrive, to improve, to seek to improve, to love, to connect, to and to, of course, to just to survive as in the, the, the biological needs, the eating and the drinking of water. We have those imperatives that we're completely going against um, and have designed a society to go against. Um, and, and I feel like it's just, it's very primitive. And we're almost like the dumbest race in on our planet and clearly in the entire universe. That's it's not to give a little context to that. When you say, you know, we are doing these things, it's a very few people who have sort of set up these rules, set up the game. This is how the economy works. You go to work, you buy a house, you do all this stuff. They made the rules of the game. We're stuck right. playing in it. And the people making the decisions, yeah, they don't have the best interests of those people below them at heart because they don't they don't live in the same world as the average person these are people that you know are worth hundreds of millions or billions of dollars you can't possibly understand a layman or think you do i don't care how much philanthropy you do take away the tax incentives and see how much money these billionaires donate okay <laughs> so yeah we as a globe have not made good decisions but we have allowed a very few people to make right. poor decisions. And now we're all stuck dealing with it. So that's kind of my take on things as far as, you know, be humble. How do we look at this phenomenon was your question? What do we think yeah. about not being the bigger fish? Think that you're not the bigger fish. Realize that, accept that. 
be okay with that. You know, I still believe we were born with everything we need to make it through this journey. We just get complicated and we get brainwashed. And, you know, this civilization is a couple hundred thousand years old now. These rules go way back. And whoever set it up this way clearly didn't have the foresight to see what it would become. Overpopulation, pollution, greed. There are some cultures and religions that have not bought into that and they still have their purity, so to speak. But Amish. generally speaking, unless you're going to disconnect from the grid and go eat grubs and drink puddle water, <laughs> you've got to work in this stupid <laughs> system that somebody set up. It's just how right. it is. So just be humble. Acknowledge that. Humility. We humble. didn't all choose this. It was our ancestors, some of it. And it's the people we had in politics, people we currently have in politics, and the ones we will have in the future as well. So the system doesn't break unless we break it. And until we realize that a very few people are making decisions of what suits them best, and all of us are stuck having to deal with the ramifications. That's the biggest issue. Yeah, I think, you know, you think about how far back, you know, our struggles have been when, you know, the struggles back in the day was, you know, for you and, and the tribe that you were in to go get food you know, to go you know, get water and that everybody was, you know, fine. And, you know, infant mortality rates were through the roof. Right. You know what I mean? Like you, you and, lived and, to be like 35 years old. <laughs> like, yeah. You were, not tops. You were not like, even. <laughs> yeah, not even like 22 was probably the average yeah. of what people actually That's why you got, got married to at to, 14 because right? they were going <laughs> to die in 10 years. They were gonna die, yeah. yeah. It, till death do us part, you know, they meant it back then because it's like it could be a couple of months until that happens. And now it's like <laughs> so 85 wife, years. I right? didn't know it was uh, <laughs> a couple hundred years ago. We didn't even know if we'd be together 50 years. We thought we would be dead by now. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it used to be a 10 year contract. Now it's like a <laughs> 60 like, year contract. Uh, absolutely. But you know what? Like even thinking about our nature, it's the same thing as uh, ants. You know, ants do their jobs every right. day. They go out, they don't question anything. They just do what they're supposed to do to feed the machine, to keep things alive we do the same thing we have patterns that we do like we, we we're not good at uh we like repetition we like things that are familiar to us and so right. we do that now we're at a point where we don't have to worry about the food we don't have to worry about the water right that's already taken care of we got a lot more time on our hands to ponder things like uaps and actually pay attention and to the point where people are running out of things to do that they're dyeing their hair a certain color and then going on the internet saying they identify as a snail. <laughs> Crazy. And that's just, yeah, right? You might want to edit that out if you want to. No offense no, to any of the no, snail people no, out no, there. No, We're really people. sorry. We don't mean to offend you. you Jason have does not speak on behalf of the UAP studies when it comes to snail affiliation. I just want to be very clear about Disclaimer, that. Disclaimer, audience. <laughs> We're going to get so much snail mail. <laughs> it's going to be crazy. Yeah. Um, I squirrel yeah, people too. Okay. We're real sorry. <laughs> no harm. Yeah, oh but gosh. you know we're we're at the point where we have all this time on our hands. We have the capabilities of of pondering the bigger questions and chasing things. The problem is is that we have a tendency to remain regressive. You know, we're right. we're making so much progress. We made so much progress, and then like within the last five years, it's like what the hell happened? Like I know COVID happened, but like the whole society is falling apart. Now all of a sudden, it's yeah, it's just it's jinx and people are, are don't know where to throw themselves anymore and here they are laughing that you know the possibilities that we might be visited by entities of some other location and it, we don't know where but they'll laugh at that like ha ha that's ridiculous yeah snail snails like it's just it's crazy you know what i mean like it's dumb and it, it, it is it, i think to your point like what what bothers me is that people human beings tend to generally tend to focus on things that are that are irrelevant I mean, it's to our survival and also to our to our sense of fulfillment. And we've created this social, you know, this very strong social construct to our society that we focus more on the social aspect of it. And we've created these this new way of viewing ourselves in the world that is not attached necessarily attached to reality and every and i mean everybody does it in all, all aspects of both on all sides and all aspects of anything the spectrum is cluttered with people who are just not matching with objective reality yeah and <clears throat> i always thought to myself you know when i first started this podcast i was going to do it from the perspective of somebody who's wondering why we're not we're not looking at the Kardashev method or the Kardashev scale and why we're not trying to push towards as a civilization 
that being a, a type one civilization. We're a type zero civilization. Not even. I mean, if there, if there was a type negative zero, negative one, we would be it. And and so why are we focusing on on things that are irrelevant to the to the survival of all of us? Why are we focusing on things that are irrelevant to? I mean, we're we're focusing on things that lead to our eminent destruction, ourselves. Um, and I, I that was the original purpose of, of the podcast, but it evolved into this. And now I wonder, like, what is the thing that would bring us all together? And usually it's catastrophe. Catastrophe tends to bring people together more so than anything else. And unfortunately, my and from what I see and from what I understand about the world, my worldview is that until there is a great catastrophe, we will never be unified. And I mean one that shakes the entire world, one that affects every single human being across the globe. Unless there is a catastrophe of some kind, people just won't come together. It's almost like catastrophe serves a purpose in our development. And I worry that before there before there is disclosure, we will probably destroy ourselves. That's my concern. Absolutely. Very, very uh, Ronald Reagan asked, you know, if we only knew or if there was an outside force, how quickly would we all unite to uh, right. defend ourselves against that force? And I hope that that's not the government. I mean, I don't think the government has our best interest in mind no matter what. So I don't think I don't believe that the government that could be wrong. And there is there is a reason to to consider the possibility that the government is creating a threat narrative for the sake of unifying the world against a, a potential threat that actually doesn't exist, um, creating a threat out of these beings. But if that's the case, they're once again leading to our, our destruction because because we can't even shoot these things down. So why start a war with them? <laughs> that's stupid. Yeah. That's and like which country gets <laughs> which country gets to authorize that? You know, to, well, to shoot, start shooting them all, down. Like they're speaking yeah. on behalf of the whole world at that point. So you know what I mean? Like these entities probably don't understand what a country is. They just look at you know they'll go wherever they want to, uh, you know. But if you got planes starting to shoot them down, they'll think that all the planes are trying to shoot them down. Like you know, this is who makes that call, and it, it can't be the United States. They don't speak on behalf of the whole world. They have their own issues with the UAPs. I understand that, but you know, it's as if. Canada started firing with you know our jets, not that we have many um, at, at these things, uh, it, there would be repercussions, right? If we constantly try to chase these things down and shoot them, yeah. obviously, if they go to the States, they're going to be, you know, very wary of your, of your own jets, right? So, yeah, I think this is a, an issue that, you know, as a society, we have to deal like, how are we going to deal with this phenomenon globally? Because every country right now is in it for themselves. Right either trying to solve the puzzle, the Messiah complex, like I will be the one that that, that solves this or, or proves or it. Or achieve technological dominance through the technology. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's the scary bit, right? Because they, basically it affects everybody on this planet. Whoever has this technology will dominate over everyone. Someone speculated that if there was a gravitational bomb, now I'm not going to even try to understand the science behind what that even means, but that if, if there was a gravity bomb, Forget about nuclear; it would it would be beyond catastrophic. It would eat your galaxy. He'd create a yeah, wormhole, would, ex exactly. Or a black hole. Literally destroy the entire solar system or more, as you were saying. Yeah. So, like, so yeah. The again, the reason why the government doesn't tell us all, I can understand. Again, I can understand why, but I think there needs to be at least an admission that there is something else that's not human. I think that telling us that there's a non-human intelligence doesn't say, "Hey, by the way, you can steal their technology, and this is what you can do with it." You can keep that stuff a secret. We need to know what's out there. We need to know mm -hmm. that there is something out there. And I think they're slowly telling us that there's something out there. Um, I'm telling you, if you're paying attention, if you read if you're paying the attention. lines, if you're paying and attention. again, how do they just come out and say that we've been lying to you for seventy years and still save the faith of the public? They're never going to tell you yeah. specifically. And to the answer, the, the question that a lot of people ask, why don't they land on the White House? If we got our hands on one of these things, we would yes. do every single test imaginable and torture the poor thing and take samples and cut into it and scan they, it have, and hook it up to machinery. Done. Like we, we would done. torture it until it died. Like, why would they come here? We're horrible people. So you I remember saw the, uh, the the Simpsons episode where uh, oh. Miss, uh, Mr. Burns goes through these radiation uh therapy but he comes out of the woods always disoriented and he his eyes are dilated looks like an alien and i don't remember he's that radiating one. green I'm light watch that now <laughs> yeah and then now. he's like i bring you love he says that to the whole <laughs> town of, of of springfield and then mo the bartender says 
kill it it's bringing love <laughs> i keep thinking of that wow. that's what we would do wow. right like yeah, yeah. that's actually yeah. amazing that's amazing okay let me just wrap my mind give me a moment because that that's that analogy well that reference is perfect we probably would fight like hell to fight against the idea of bringing love and unity to us all mm -hmm. it's almost like the the powers that be have convinced us all that unifying is is a problem. In the U.S., we have division is like is like the the name of the game here. You know, if you're if you, the most divisive person is the most famous person, and that's literally across again across all spectrums. I've heard somebody say that if you are not if you don't believe now if, you, if audience in case you're listening and you don't know I am an African American man. I'm a black brown person. Okay, so there is some things that I focus that I have to keep taken into account for that some people might not. And one of those things, of course, is race. I have to think about it because my life has told me and my experiences have told me, hey, there's something to you being of this color in this country. On the one side, you have people that call themselves um, people that believe in justice, people that believe in social equality. But they say that if somebody believe, believes something that is incorrect and that can be harmful, that they are that they that they cannot come over to that side of the aisle. We will not accept you. We won't even give you a, the time of day. As a matter of fact, we're going to try to ruin your life because we don't like what you're saying. We don't like you. And there is a – I remember a man, a black man, who would go to these KKK meetings literally to find out what they believe and what they think and to, to, to kind of connect with them in a way that nobody would do from, from somebody like my, commu my our community because he wants to understand. And by understanding, you can reach them, yeah. right? It's it's by exploring these ideas, letting people say, I don't like you and here's why. Instead of saying, Well, that hurts me and I think you need to be canceled, or I think you need to go to jail, or I think you should, you know, send a mob after you. Give people a chance to speak and so we can to understand them. I watch a guy named Vouch argue with real Nazis, literal Nazis. And by the end of the conversation, they thank him for listening to him, to them. Thank you for having the conversation. Thank you. They, there's a camaraderie. And Vouch is on the side of the straight up SJW, far left, you know, whatever, whatever. But he's but he was able to, you know, talk to them and they appreciated that. Now, he wasn't nice to them, but at least he had the conversation and they appreciated it. And I think that when we look at our differences, no matter how vile, how disgusting, how wrong we think they may be, we have to listen to people. We have to give them a chance to talk and to and to, and to let them say, I don't like you. Why? And ask them why. And let's figure it out together. That's the only way forward for us all in this country. That's what I. That's how I see things. That's really how I see things. Sometimes when we hear inflated. ourselves talk, we realize how ridiculous it is. And a lot of people that have had issues with hate or have been affiliated with groups, when they look back and realize why they joined the group, it wasn't because they actually had the hate. It was because there was a feeling of camaraderie and I right. belong. Right. And the ideology just kind of it was loosely there. Yeah, they weren't like completely against it but they weren't as hardcore as they became. That was right. the mob mentality and what wore off on them. And when they, you know, changed their lives and said, I, I can't believe I did that for 20 years. When you look at the causational effects, it wasn't deep rooted hatred. No, it may have been, I Prejudice, was robbed by somebody not, as a kid and now I hate them. It was in a, it's trauma. Like most people's baggage is trauma related, family, relationship, violence, cultural, monetary, whatever it is. It's all like a breach of that trust and love. And rather than dealing with that, that hurt, like you said, it just becomes, I hate you and I'll spend my whole life making people just like you uncomfortable, you know, yeah. and you still never heal. You've never still dealt with that initial trauma. And, you know, you pass that, that on to your kids and right. then they pass Spreads. it on to yeah. their kids. Right. Like racism, for instance, if you think about it, usually comes from the, the parent side, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, when I was a kid, because I was French Canadian, I lived out here on, on the coast and, um, you know, there was a separation, or at least Quebec was trying to separate. I think this is like 93, 94. And uh, Quebec was uh, hosting an election to try to see if they could separate from Canada. It was a big deal and it should wow. be. Um, but when I was here in school, all I would hear the kids was like, you guys, French Canadians, bunch of separatists and blah, blah, blah. And you're a waste of time. And like, you could tell it was the dad that was talking. That it wasn't that. the kid, yeah, right? I was just hearing that. what the dad's opinion at home was. And, uh, I would go to Quebec, uh, by the time the election went through, uh, and it didn't pass Quebec still part of Canada, but 
the French people were saying the exact same thing about the English people that what they were saying in BC, like bunch of English people, you know, right. good. And it's like, dude, it's the same crap on it. Just because you speak a different language, you view somebody else as being different than you having different standards than you. And is, we do that globally. Like, you know, I, I mean, not saying that, you know, Iran is the place to be right now, but <laughs> our our view of Iran, you know, is is by the the Western media, right? They're showing us the bad parts of Iran. There probably are some good parts. We'll never know because it's all about a point of view. What we're shown, what we're taught, um, you know, we're 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 trained that way, right? So it's it's a big problem. We we need to to learn to not let people think for us, but allow ourselves to think. Well, 500 years that, ago, other cultures coming was bad news. They were coming to take your shit right, and right. steal your jewels and, and rape your women and burn your city down. So that's kind of like our archaic brain reacting, not our civilized brain or what we think right. is a civilized brain. That's just the reaction of, I don't recognize these people. Do you know them? No, we need to panic because it was always bad news. Nobody would trek months and months and months and bring food and rations unless they were going to take you over. There was no vacationing, you know, 2000 years ago. And so they had I think that's just, because, yeah. Yeah. It's within us. That's why China you know, built a freaking wall. <laughs> right? A big one. Exactly. They call it the yeah. great wall. Literally. Yeah. You know, you know, there's a, there's some, there's a lot to be said about the, I think that it all boils down to, to some pretty basic principles. Some things like compassion, some things like trying to understand and connect, having a desire to connect. We all want to connect, right? And expanding your tribe from the small, you know, the small circle that you have and being able to expand, expand that tribe. And a lot of that, I know that there is a danger to that in today's world, but I think at least if we have those principles, then as a consequence, we will naturally just evolve into a society that does, that that is able to feel safe around each other, where we can feel mm -hmm. safe just around each other. But when we have this very primal, you know, protective and animalistic uh, uh, feeling about each other because of what you just said, Louis, because of how things used to be. We we are st it's still almost like it's ingrained in us. Like it's now it's like a biological process to just be naturally afraid. Um, if we keep functioning from that place of fear and not from a place of love and compassion and understanding and wanting and a desire to connect then we will never become the society that we can be. We'll never achieve as a society, as a glow, as a world, our full potential. And we'll always be struggling. And there will always, will always be suffering and, and, and a lot mass, you know, um, I guess, genocides and murder and war and all this stuff. Our own destruction is eminent. And unless we literally start our thinking from that place of compassion and wanting to understand and connect, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it bottom line and whenever civilization is watching this happen or whatever they are you know whether interdimensional or extraterrestrial or under the sea or you know the atlanteans i wonder if they see that and are trying to to give us a message or if they're preparing for what we have decided is going to be our fate we've chosen it and they see that and they're like non-interventionalists, you know, non-interventionalists. They just kind of have to wait and see what we do as a civilization and let us on our own path. I don't know. But Maybe I, that's but why I, they're making clones because they to, know we're all going to, you know, to save blow our ourselves up to, to, yeah. to nothing. And uh, they're just making clones and trying to keep the species. Like, this guy had great hair. We need another one like him, but get rid of the shitty brain. Let's give him a good <laughs> brain this time because he's a good looking guy. <laughs> Jason, I'm talking about. Oh, wow. oh naturally, yeah, naturally. Yeah. The wow. clone of Jason is going to be phenomenal. Just a brainiac, I'm telling you. So we covered a lot of things today, and and honestly, I I I didn't think it would last this long. I'm really glad you guys stayed for with me this long. I want to talk more about you now. I want to talk about your podcast. I want to talk about what you're doing, what you've done. You know, I watched. I've been watching all of your content since I met you. Got a lot of content. A lot of your content's on on um on your podcast version. But there's but your YouTube channel. I'm almost through your YouTube channel. I'm almost completely oh, wow. through it. Thank so, you. So, um, th thank you. You put. Hey, man, you guys put this out there. I I am. I'm I'm eating it up. I'm eating it up, and I, I can't always get to the newer stuff because since I've I've been researching and having to do my own topics, especially with the weekend show that I'm on now on SOR, it's been it's been and with my business, it's been very difficult lately. But man, I was killing your content when I first when I first discovered you. I was killing that content. Um, so you guys interview everyone. You interview people, like I said before, like Jacques Vallée. You're going to be interviewing Gary Nolan. 
and and now you're going to be interviewing um uh, uh Richard Dolan which uh which is going to be oh man I mean you talk about the guys that know stuff right the biggest investigative journalists and, and reporters of of UAP and UFO and alien and extraterrestrial they've got books out they got the Ross Coldheart with need to know um in his book uh in plain sight which I've read I have that book I Oh my gosh, you got to read it. And then, of course, with Richard Dolan, I read his book, um, Alien Agendas, which is a speculative analysis on these different types of beings that it might be, according to eyewitness testimony, and what their agendas might be. It's a speculative analysis, and it's really interesting. So you guys have a lot in store. You've got some. You got a lot of questions you can ask, you know. And I always ask people after after all the people you've talked to, after all the the things that you've probably heard. I'm I'm gonna keep asking you this every time we talk. What do you think about the phenomena right now? What's your view about what it is? Who's behind the craft? And that you can say. I don't want you to disrespect anybody's confidence. You know, if they told you something you're not supposed to tell. But what do you think that this phenomena is? I know that you believe it's multiple, but I mean the intelligence behind. It. Give me some ideas of what you think it is, and what do you think its intentions are, based off of your experience now. Uh, you know what I'm going to say for my part, I think that it's, um, cause we explored many aspects of this phenomenon, but one thing that always comes back is there's, there's certain things that you start noticing. There's like patterns, uh, when you talk to investigators about, you know, this, like I mentioned, this could be a university, uh, course, right? You got cattle mutilation, abduction phenomenon, crop circles, you got, uh, close encounters. You got, you know, like I mentioned the abduction and, and just there's different varieties of, of things like even Bigfoot somehow right, worked its right. way in there. I and know, I was like I so adamant on not having Bigfoot being part of it. Uh, but I just, all the, you know, people we start talking to, they're all like, Oh yeah, Bigfoot's related. I'm like, damn it. Um, <laughs> cause it's, you know, we have to deal with it. Right. But I, I think, to make sense of the world, not be confused more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't add extra stuff to it. Right. Um, you know, Elvis is still alive. Uh, <laughs> the, but the main thing is that I think that consciousness keeps coming back and keeps creeping into the subject. Like, you know, consciousness has a huge part to play with this. And I asked Louie and uh, Reverend uh, Michael Carter uh, the other night, I just, or the other day, uh, you know, what do you guys think it's a, a universal consciousness? Because mm -hmm. consciousness and awareness of self is a natural progression of the universe. The universe started with the Big Bang, the cool down, molecules started forming together. And eventually what it leads to is creating life. And then that life eventually creates consciousness. And consciousness, once it's elevated high enough, can do probably the most wonderful things in this universe. It's a natural progression of it. And maybe our consciousness is the same as all the other species that are out there. We're just at different levels of understanding it. Wow. Maybe if we all understand that we're all part of this universal consciousness or God, as you will, and that that's where we go back after we die, we go back to this great consciousness and maybe repeat a cycle somewhere else. Who knows? Uh, but that's what I'm starting to think now that this has a huge part to play in all of this. And it's constantly mentioned to people uh, and, and, you know, they'll see grays and grays will say, you know, like you need to raise your consciousness or I felt like my consciousness was alive or I flew the craft with my consciousness. Like some right. people actually get to I've fly the crafts. Right? right. And, you know, their consciousness expands all the way around the crafts. They become the craft itself and they could do whatever the hell they want. So we keep hearing that. So that's my theory so far. For me, it's it's very similar to what Jason said there. It's I've become less of a nuts and bolts person. I don't actually think I believe anymore that little green men are flying on mechanical <laughs> ships from 200 million light years away. I, right. I don't think you're going to hit an asteroid. Even if you could right. go 10 times the speed of light, you're going to hit something. So I, I don't believe it like it used to be on the fringe way. I think it's a lot deeper. It's above our pay grade. I don't think we're actually going to figure it out. I really don't. I think Maybe. we will get acknowledgement that, there are other life forms out there. I think we are all sentient beings. The only difference between us and animals is we question, you know, who am I? Why am I here? What is this all for? Uh, I think we were given that gift to, to question. And why were we, right? Something wants us to be awakened. None of the other animal kingdom has that. It's, no. you know, animals will eat their babies 
if it comes to them right. or the baby's life. A human right. being will die before they eat their infant, right? For the most Unless part. you live in Russia, they ate their own kids during the Second World War, unfortunately. But Times were tough. Sometimes the you gotta eat tough. baby. You know, right? yeah, but, yeah. But yeah, to answer your question, Marquise, I, I've become more spiritual. Nothing reinforces my belief in God, whatever that looks like, whatever energy that is, nothing reinforces that more than the obvious possibility that there's more than life on just this planet. Like the type of creative being that I believe God is, isn't limited to just putting simple life. And we are simple life, simple minded right. life anyway, on one little watery stone in a universe with potentially trillions of planets. Like, I just think it's the peak of human ignorance to think we know what it is. And he, or even if you don't, if you're yeah. one of those people that doesn't say, I know what it is. If you say it's definitely not that you're saying the exact same thing, right? Because if it's not that, then you know, it's not that therefore, you know what it is. So we catch ourselves in these negative patterns of expertise we are all couch ufologists, people, right. even the people writing books and making documentaries. Right. Nobody knows or has proof. So, you know, recently on my Facebook page, I'm at the point now where I can't really get many more friends because they cap you out at like four or five thousand or whatever it is. Oh, wow. So I'm I'm deleting flat earthers. I'm deleting <laughs> people that are calling people idiots because they don't know what they're talking about. I'm just looking for an excuse to wax a few people. <laughs> For being non-tolerant, right? right? So the the best thing that I could suggest to anybody, whether you've been doing this for 50 years and you should know more, you should also be more humble because people like Jacques Vallée, who have a right to say, hey, I know more than you. I don't care what you think. He's even saying suspend judgment. Don't, as right. soon as you get to the point where you think you know, you're losing. So let it be this mystical thing. Again, if you are a spiritual person or not, regardless, we are not in captivity right now from these beings. No, they are not hurting us or whatever. It's maybe it's an agenda, future plan, a million and one theories. But at the end of the day, I still believe that if your light is bright, darkness can't affect you, even in the form of poltergeist. I never worry that ghosts are going to haunt me because I know my energy level. I know my I, I know the brightness of my candle. So I'm not scared of that stuff and I'm not scared of aliens or what it could be. I don't, as, as sad as it is for me to realize, I don't think we're ever going to know. I don't think we're wired to know, but I think we will get closer. I think we will get acknowledgement. Uh, and I think it is for our better good. I don't think we're too far gone. I know you're like, we've decided <sighs> we made our own choice and they're here to pick up the scraps. I don't think it's that far gone yet. We've been down this road before, but, creation and destruction is cyclical if we don't do it ourselves nature will do it in a hundred billion years when the universe cools down so just be humble and just meditate if everybody meditated we would all be more calm people we would find Absolutely. our own version Absolutely. of god spirituality you would worry more about your stuff and less about other people's stuff so my advice for 2023 is aliens are real and you should meditate more. <laughs> that's good. It's a bumper sticker right there. Look, great. That's yeah. awesome. We have to tag that. Hold on. Let me say, I'll say that with that comment as well. You can Jason. quote me on that people. Aliens are real and we should meditate people. Okay. So two <laughs> things. One, those answers were, I, my brain itched for like, what, what do you think? What do you think it is? You guys just scratched the itch in my brain with your answers. Good. Like both of you. So that uh, the consciousness centered, um, understanding of the phenomena i think i do believe that more and so now i think we're looking at a phenomena that's operating more on the on the quantum realm in the quantum realm which is more along the lines of what we would consider the spiritual energetic or vibration or whatever and when i think about trying to understand the phenomena i think of dr strange or that movie uh inception where they're like jumping into dream realities and things are changing and they're dynamic and it's there's no catching hold of anything and it's all like you know you can never really get a grasp on what, but it, when you do think you have it, it changes. It's like that. It's like that. It's just like that. Where whatever this is, as soon as we think we might have an understanding of what this aspect is, boom, surprise, there's another aspect that we didn't even know about. Oh, by the way, there's another one. By the way, there's another one. And the, uh, and the, and the possibilities continue to multiply. It's like the phenomena if it is either is either – Making sure that we never figure out what it is because, or that it's just by nature, just not understandable by us. 
like you said. And then again, every time we think we've got it, it's more multiple things pop up to show us that there's more to it. That's why my my understanding of it keeps changing. But it all boils down to to, to, to two things for me, consciousness and quantum mechanics or quantum physics for me. I like to stick to yeah, science. Newtonian physics break down when you start looking at things with the quantum level. There's a you need a new science to understand because things go from being just potential energy and somehow through an observer or a conscious thought, they become matter. And billiard ball physics and gravity, as we know it, does not even come close to explaining that. We need a different yardstick to be able to measure this type of stuff. Yeah. Some element is there and then it's not there. Like, how can it yeah. exist and not exist or at the same time, right? Where it's in multiple yeah. places, multiple, but it's not time. multiple things. It's the same, the thing, same thing, Yeah, just potentially in different spots or quantum entanglement. Like, you're right, Marquis. Quantum mechanics, quantum physics is the only way we're going to start. At least mathematically, we see that it might be plausible. Then we really use our best brains to try to say, well, what does that mean? What is now possible as a result? Right. But it, I think it, it is, a, yeah, it's bigger than we're going to be able to digest, at least at this point in our advancement. So the answer is that there is no answer and we're never going to find out. <laughs> but we, I much, think, I, again, yeah. I, I, I think we, I like how we all have kind of unified, at least in that aspect, because remember when we first met, you know what my perspective is, I told you. I don't believe that now. I totally don't believe that now. I think it's it's again it's much deeper, much more more it's much richer than what I thought it was at first. And I think it lies in just like what we just talked about, quantum mechanics, quantum physics, consciousness. It's all there. Yeah. yeah. So when it comes to the people that you've talked to, I can't even ask you who the most, you know, the most interesting one was because I'm sure there were so many that it's hard for you to pin down which ones. But moving forward, who are the next guests that you have coming up for your podcast that people should be looking forward to? I'll let Louis like, handle that. Yeah. Yeah. It's we've been so busy the last week, literally in the last week, we've had 15 people come together in one way, wow. shape or form. So wow. some of them, we they're, they're on a project. It's about to end and they want to come talk about it. Those people I can't reveal. A couple of people are going to be testifying at the UFO Congress convention hearings. And I think that's amazing because everybody's speculating, including us earlier, about what these reports mean. We're going to talk to somebody who's actually going to testify before Congress. Mm. We're going to ask them what they think it means. Again, I can't bring that, that up. But in terms of names we can bring up, I mean, this Sunday, we've got John Burroughs. We mentioned Rendlesham Forest. Uh, we have a director of MUFON State University. Uh, Mindy Toddfest, she's a uh, she trains new investigators, wow. and in fact, the the TV program Ancient Aliens has a new episode on February 10th, and we're interviewing her on the 12th, two days later. And that episode is dedicated to MUFON. The actual Ancient Aliens episode is going to talk about MUFON, and so for anybody who maybe didn't know much about MUFON, we mentioned them earlier. That's a great opportunity to check that out. Uh, and then it's just bangers. It's Richard Dolan, uh, it's right. Gary Nolan, it's Steve Bassett. <laughs> Um, oh you know, man, we, that's gonna be awesome! I can't. We have right. Andrew Sal Collins, salivating. You know, <laughs> there's so many. There, there's so many. I mean, last year we thought it would be pretty tough because we had the likes of George Knapp, Leslie Kane, Jim Semivan, Ross Coltard, Avi Loeb, uh, James Fox. Who else? On and on and on. Uh, Valet. Um, Calvin yeah, Parker was great. I love. Yeah, Calvin, Calvin Parker. Parker. Like it was like yeah. the who's who of ufology, and we're like, how are we gonna one up this? <laughs> and uh, yeah, this year start off with a bang too, you know, and now we're getting more into the sides of like not being scared to interview somebody like Reverend Michael Carter. Here's a man of God who believes in aliens, who had an experience. I want to get his perspective on things. And yeah. we're not so scared that somebody might send us an email saying, I didn't like that. Or why did you talk about religion or spirituality? We're okay with that. And in fact, he even said that to us that, you know, if you, if you're, Getting people outside their shell, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. It's not your job to just cater what the comfortable topics are. It's to get people thinking, well, I didn't think about that before, but you know, maybe there's something to that. And yeah. if we can open a few minds and make people a little less judgmental when it comes to this phenomenon, we're doing our job. So um, yeah, this year's a big year. There's more names I can't mention than I can. I gave you a few there. Yep. I mean, Ryan Graves is coming on as well. 
Yeah, that's um, oh, man. It's, it's just Gary like everyone, Nolan. Everyone is if you call them bangers. When I think about it, I'm like, oh, I want to talk. Oh, I want to. Oh, I want to know. I want to. Know. It's every single one of them is is the one that I want to know. I want to talk to. I want like you're doing the thing, man. You guys are doing a big thing. If there's something when you think about somebody in any field, right? They have ambitions. Oh, we want. We all want to do this thing. We all want to be like this person. You're doing the thing that every one of us wishes we could do. <laughs> oh, man, that's thanks, awesome. Man. Yeah, I appreciate that. And to you know what? We're nothing special. We're regular dudes. We started this as a hobby. The only th- you know bit of advice I will give you or anybody else who wants to get in this field is just be enthusiastic, work at it. It doesn't happen by itself. And stay persistent. Jason could have quit after 20 episodes when it didn't blow up, but he didn't. He kept going. We get together. The second year of our show was 600% what the first year was. Yeah, Actual data. And I learned this. I used to be a sales trainer teaching commission people how to sell more product. And I worked with a Chinese man. And he says, you know, sales and, and dealing with clients and building a sort of a database is like growing bamboo. You plant a seed in the ground, you water it, you give it sunlight. A year goes by, nothing happens. Next year, you water it, you sunlight give it food, nothing happens. You do that for three years and you get zero. And then on the fourth year, you get an eight foot stock. So all those three years, you thought nothing was happening. You were growing roots. And then it blew up when you least expected. Now, if you'd stop watering it at any point in time, you never would have got that that root, the the shoot. You wouldn't have got the, the prize. So just stay at it. Do it because you like it. Don't do it because you want to change the world or the narrative or you really want to get your idea on what this thing is out there, stay humble. You know, a lot of people shoot themselves in the head because they go out and try to be the next Messiah in the UFO world. <laughs> this, this group will chew you to pieces. Oh, yeah. Go look at UFO Twitter and find out for yourself. The Trust. best, <laughs> they have the biggest and best names that we talk to that get trolled to death out there. It sucks. It's so it, it, just it, even us, like everybody that we've interviewed, we're still being called idiots, you know, on, on Twitter <laughs> and Facebook or that's, whatever. Yeah. Like that's yeah. just the nature of the game. But if if you're like wanting to get out there, even as an investigator or somebody that's always been passionate about the subject, never done anything, get off the couch and move. You know, there's organizations you can join, like like Move On, which we've talked about today. Um, you know, there's, or you could become a private investigator, but even if you listen to, you know, everybody we've had on all the investigators, most of them just started just saying, you know, I want to get active. I want to get moving. And that's how you're going to become successful is, is big, or, you know, in this case, success is really how you measure it and, and what, right. what, you know, what is success to you. But I think like becoming an investigator, having some cases like, man, that feels good. You're actually contributing now to the community. You're, you you feel like you're part of it. Um, and and you don't have to, you know, necessarily start a podcast. Cause I mean, there's, I think they said there's over a million podcasts on Spotify that have only one episode over a million. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of podcasts are, and they say that uh, if you don't get past the seventh episode, the chances are you continuing doing the podcast is very slim. So getting past the seventh episode is very important. Uh, but yeah, like like Louis said, you just stick to your guns and uh, you know keep keep that hunger there, R- regardless of whether you become an investigator or podcaster or, or journalist or whatever it is that you want in this field. Just stay hungry, you know, and, and, and pursue it, and and don't stop. People are going to say some stupid stuff to you. Don't don't pay attention to it. Just keep going, yeah. and, and do it because you love it. Like we could have monetized eight months ago, we chose not to. You know, I mean, we don't have a a genre with billions of clicks. Like if you make a YouTube channel and do makeup reviews, you will make $10,000 a month oh, in a yeah. year. If oh, you just stay at it. Right. I see the, the ones my wife watches. <laughs> These people have professional quality stuff. So we made the decision that we are one of the few episodes that offer commercial free content. Now it may not be like that forever. At some point, the expense of doing this, that may be the only way we can continue doing it. But for now, I don't know of any other show that has interviewed the people at the level that we have right? and doesn't charge for it. We don't have Patreon. There's no paywall. There's no subscription. There's no YouTube ads, nothing. We yeah, don't even that, do the Spotify like voice. That, it makes it sound like we're missing out on something. <laughs> like we probably left a bunch of money on the table, but it's yeah. because we want to show that we're coming from a genuine 
care about this topic. Uh, we want to get these people's stories out. We don't interview anybody we don't like. There's no idiots on our show. We filter the idiots out and we just have a great conversation. It's a virtual living room. We're stoked because we were fans of these people for years. And now it's like, oh my God, Richard Dolan, like that's crazy. We get to talk with him that's and you know, wild. he's done a million shows, but we haven't talked with him. So this is our, uh, it's our journey as well as guys that were just enthusiasts that started taking it a little bit seriously and look what what can happen. I mean, we're on episode 119, I believe. Yeah. Um. And yeah, we're booked all the way through to like 140 at this point, damn near. Wow. So it's crazy. Wow. It, once it goes, it goes. And then you better be you better be ready because you're either in or you're out at that point. Yeah, and be the change that you want to see too, right? Within the community of, of UAPs and UFOs. I mean, there's so many people that. You know, the, you know, the host will, will will voice their opinions and sometimes it's not for the, you know, betterment of their, their guests, like they're grilling their guests and it's not good. Um, for us, it was really important that we, we don't do that. We let, we ask a question, we let the guests talk and it's about the guests, you know, it's, it's you about, you know, excellent conversationalists. I'll yeah. Well, that. we I mean, try. It's like, yeah. It's bizarre. Yeah. No, I've, you I've have watched... a bit of fun. If you're not getting them laughing and joking around. <laughs> Sometimes we'll do a five minute warm up with these people just to, like, this is who we are. Nice to meet you. If they're still very rigid and giving us one word answers, we don't start the show. Get the, get them laughing, get them in their yeah. zone. Then they're going to give us good content. If, if it's, they're half asleep still because it's Sunday at 8 a.m., we're going to wait 10 minutes and we're going to ask them, what are you doing later today? Whose show were you on last? Whatever we need to talk about, we will until they get to their usual self because that's what our viewers want. So we we put in the work and uh, massage these people. And we, in some cases, you know, like we have boxers. a good friend, a good Facebook friend, Chris Grant from Scotland. Shout out to our buddy. I'm pretty sure he's all of our friends, but he, he basically yeah, he'll say sometimes, you know, you, uh, you so and so's coming on your show. Oh, man, put a key in his back and let him go. And we're kind of the wow. same way. You wind us up and then we will just do our thing. <laughs> and most of our guests will, too. They love it just yeah. as much as we do. And that's what you're picking up on when you say, wow, that was a great episode. It's because we were all we created an energy and then we just tossed that beach ball back and forth for an hour. Yeah, a lot of times I feel like a lot of this is just general with anything that people do on their own. People tend to not truly people that are not involved in the thing that you're producing, whatever it may be. They don't fully understand what it takes to do it, and they don't fully appreciate like how well you're doing that thing. You have to watch somebody who's a who's got a terrible show, and then watch yeah. your show, and then you'll be like, "Wait a minute, why are there worlds of differences here?" We're talking. I've seen some shows where I liked them before, and then I hear your show, and I'm like, "Wait a minute, why have I been wasting my time on this show?" <laughs> and it's just for we the entertainment. We're that. just like, yeah. it's again, it's not. I'm not the one who I don't do anything by watching your show. It's just I'm just being entertained, but I'm also being informed. And that to me is the most important thing is like, I want to know more. I want to understand more. I want to hear what these people have to say. There's like a, there's like an, a, a learning by osmosis. Mm -hmm. That process that I go through by c consuming the right content is much more effective for my growth personally. And of course, with this, this endeavor, then it would be just to be entertained by some other podcaster who's just like putting a bunch of random non-verifiable like kind of not tangible, just just pure entertainment value. Um, it's nice to be entertained, but it's much more important to to have something help you with your personal growth. And that's what I think your channel does. So where can people who have that desire to want to grow, to want to understand that be really engaged with the content that they're putting out, not just be entertained, but also be entertained? Where can they find you? So we are uh, everywhere. If you go on Google and search UAP Studies Podcast, there's six pages of stuff comes up. Go to YouTube, UAP Studies Podcast, Spotify, UAP Studies Podcast, UAP Studies Podcast.com. Same on Apple Podcast. Essentially, any media property out there, if you search for us, you'll find us. Uh, feel free to message us. We answer everybody's message, email. Absolutely. Yeah. Go to our website. You can hit contact us, share your stories, guest request, just saying hi. We've had people share intimate things and say, hey, you covered this topic. It was, you know, I, I almost cried a little, but I feel better now that I watched it. We get some real heartfelt stuff and that's what gets us going. And uh, we promise to be the best moral compass we can. We will never put anybody on that's just spewing trash or stuff that you cannot prove. We, we get these people to give us a story 
but we know that story is based on facts as much as everybody can confirm it is. Nobody right. really knows anybody's stuff, but right. it'll be well accepted and verifiable, not Johnny, you know, has dreams and talks to aliens. There are shows for that. <laughs> We're just not that show. We are yeah. science-based, fact-based. We interview military people, scientists, people who have been on television and write documentaries about this phenomenon, people who have made it their life's work, and some of them who take considerable risk to even talk about this stuff. We give them their 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 time. We give them their due respect. So that's what we're all about. Fantastic. I want to thank you guys both for coming on to my podcast because, again, you know, this is this means a lot to me. This whole effort that I'm doing with the podcast, it means a lot to me. The content I put out, I'm doing, of course, the SOR thing on the weekends. And then I want to do more. I want to do more for my my podcast and my platform as well. And given who you are, the giants that you guys are, I really appreciate that I got you two giants on my show. And I'm talking good looking giants. You guys, you're oh. dressed snappy. Look at this guy. Look at this guy. Look at this. Look at this guy. Man. Look at oh, this guy. Man. Yeah. They're beautiful men. Look at that. I appreciate it. And I want to, I, we were always welcome. I look forward to more conversations here um, on the, on my podcast with you guys as well. So well, looking forward to Thanks, more man. conversation as well. Man. We love you, brother. We encourage you. We think you should go uh, with your show, go hard with it. You're a bright minded guy. People love you in the comments. I've seen you do your thing on other shows. <laughs> Be confident. What people like you, right? You you made it this far. You have your own far. podcast I've this now. Far. I've been holding yeah. on. You know, it's been fun. It's been great. You're, You're taking great action. Host. Yeah, great host. Yeah. You're a great host. Thank you guys. So we'll come Thank back you anytime you want us to, man. All right. I look forward to the next conversation. You guys take care.